You just do. There's also like some noise. You guys hear that? No. You don't hear any some noise? Sort of hum. I yeah. Hum. Is that yeah. What you're yeah. Like it wasn't there at first. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't hear yeah, anything. I do Killer hear Bob. That. Yeah. Is it a fan? Or like air conditioning? We all know how dangerous fans can be. Yeah. Could you mute your mic, Nicole, just to see if sure. it's on your end? Yeah. It sounds okay. like it might be on your end. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. Well, let me. Something yeah. of fingers. Oh, I have time yeah. to go. You know what? I'm going to stop that. Oh, I'll let it go. That's how the sausages are made. This is how we form sausages. People are going to watch me open candy. Can you still hear it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it sounds like uh, maybe an air conditioning unit. I don't know. Yeah, it just might be the AC. Okay. Can I this right? Maybe. I would uh, I would turn my AC off for you guys, but I would cook in here. <laughs> yeah, I know no that's okay. understandable. It's summer. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just ambient. I can't. It's not like super prominent for me. Is that for you? <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, we should go. Okay. Yeah, we're recording now. Randy, hit that music. Okay. and welcome to another Honey Pot episode of Straight Chilling, the weekly horror movie review show where you chill and we kill, slice, dice, and chop up yet another horror movie. My name's Bob. I'll be your host for this evening. This is episode number 334, recorded on Monday, August 30th, 2021. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the latest from Nia DaCosta, Candyman. Before we get into the review, let me introduce everyone else on the show. First up, calling in from Washington, D.C., we got our boy, Randu, how do you? Randu, what's up, buddy? How you doing? Better now that you uh, you're using that bump a little more often. You know, I like to tease. I like to give a little bit, a little bit here, and then withdraw a little bit there. You know, got to keep you know, it fresh. It's almost time to reinstate the pumpkins bump. I mean, I don't know if I'm ready to cross that threshold, All especially right. because it's so precious to you. Um, so I'm gonna draw it out a long, long time. I think. I'm just priming you. I'm priming you for it. We'll get there eventually. I know. And I'm rejecting your priming. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Next up, calling in from my immediate left, we got our boy Soju. What's up, man? What up, bitch, your boy, honey, Stains. <laughs> nice. I like that. It's a nice touch. <laughs> you know, there are songs with the word honey in it. You don't no, know. No. No. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. We have I didn't one song that on was this not podcast actually accurate. and one song only. <laughs> and it's well, we used dancing. to, and but I've been I, I be stroking who's retired, as you would call. So. <laughs> I be stroking. <laughs> Last but not least, uh, making her triumphant return to our podcast. Everybody, welcome back, Nicole. What's up, Nicole? Say my name. Say my name. Ooh, there you go. Yeah, now yeah. there are yeah. two songs. <laughs> there you go. Now we owe Beyonce a fuck ton of money. <laughs> Just like everyone else. Hell yeah. Uh, thanks for sitting in with us again, Nicole. Um, if you want to remind everybody about your own horror podcast, go ahead and do so real quick. Thank you. Um, I'm super excited to be back on with you guys. It's been a little bit. Um, but of course, because we're on Slack all the time, it feels like it hasn't been very long because we still right. talk on the regular. Um, but my podcast is Light and Shadow, 
And um, we have kind of a connection with the episode tonight because you guys were on my Candyman series last year. Um, so I'm really excited to sort of like revisit that conversation a little bit and uh, come full circle and, you know, kind of see what things are different, what things have remained, and um, just sort of finish out that discussion. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a, been a long time coming because we, we did those three episodes on your show Um uh, Juice, you talked about the original Candyman. I talked about the second, and Randy, you were a guest talking about the third. I got the sloppy thirds. <laughs> yeah. And it was all in preparation for this new movie coming out, and then of course it was delayed for like fourteen or fifteen months. So we we're like, no. Yeah. Uh, so finally, we're we're concluding our Candyman series tonight. Uh, we're excited to do so. But make sure to check out Light and Shadow podcast uh, for the Candyman episodes, but also for all of our back catalog because it's good shit. You won't regret it. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, let's go ahead and tackle some housekeeping real quick. Um, here's your final reminder. We have our September poll pick currently posted on our Patreon website. If you support us at the $5 level or above, you get the chance to vote on a movie we're talking about this September. The theme for September is Halloween Party. The three movies to vote between are Casper, The Guest, and Night of the Demons. Bob, Hong tell Kong. me Casper's leading, please. Casper is still in second place. <laughs> uh, yeah, Night of the Demons is in first place. The Guest is in last. Um, you have like a day left to vote, so make sure you yeah. do so before the end of August, and we'll see what we're talking about. If you're hashtag hard with Casper, get on the old Patreon and vote. Nobody's hard with Casper. <laughs> that bitch is not corporeal. That's right. Dude, your boy Soju's hard with Casper. I'll tell you that right now. What a weird sentence. To <laughs> that is that is that is a child. A ghost child. Soju. Yeah. Let's be careful. Yeah. Strange. Who is that? Devin Sawa in that movie, or some some like yeah, it is Devin. some like yeah. Tiger beats. Okay, yeah. Sawa. Yeah. Well, we all know how Bob feels about that. I'm, I'm a down. Sawa boy. <laughs> Dude, I was so hoping you had that bum ready to go. <laughs> it's like I, ooh, I he's am. queuing this up good. I hope he True. remembers that bump exists. True statement. Randy really set himself up. The alley <laughs> and good. the oop. Nice, nicely done. Every so often. Um. We have, uh, in other Patreon news, we have not one, but two brand new Patreon supporters we got to give mad shouts yeah. outs to. Um, big thanks to Robbie S. and Gary L. for joining in the ranks and showing us some love on Patreon. It really does help us out. It means a lot to us. Every dollar you guys contribute goes right back into the show. And uh, as is tradition around these parts, we owe you both the straight chilling salute. Uh, these go out to Robbie and Gary. Here you go. Slap my ass. And one more. Slap me in the ass. All right. Um, just to show how Patreon actually does help us. If you are watching on YouTube on the behind the scenes, this nice new professional equipment that I finally have after seven years, in which case before I was just putting a He's microphone. gesturing towards his dick on a huge stack of Bob's Blu-rays, and now I have a proper <laughs> mic stand thanks to the Patreon yes. supporters. Yes, I remember those stacks. Yeah, Nicole knows. <laughs> yeah. She's like well, from way back. And yeah, even up until like three weeks ago, that's what yeah. I was doing. Now Rob's Blu-ray collection has no utility at all. No purpose whatsoever. <laughs> Just throw it in the trash. Everything's digital, so yeah, I'm throwing them all away now. Uh, no, that's not true at all. Speaking of physical media, uh, we got a brand new episode of Let's Get Physical Media posted everywhere you get your podcasts. Um, Mikey and I talk Ooh. about we talk about our July pickups. We talk about a wide variety of movies, uh, probably like forty or so titles. Um, Jesus Christ! A, a lot of it's horror, but not all of it is. Um, so if you have any interest in Blu-rays, 4Ks, DVDs, uh, a lot of a lot of it is uh, put up by these boutique labels that we are so fond of check out let's get physical media everywhere you get your podcasts bob how many jet skis do you think you're up to at this point uh, it's been almost two years since we did the countdown so i don't I mean, have to answer these questions <laughs> at least three or four i'd say yeah <laughs> i i don't know i i think you do but... i have no idea <laughs> Nice. <laughs> I forgot about the other song we do. <laughs> we 
40 titles, Bob. That's that's a new propeller. Right Randy, there. Randy's on that the It might be game. a fucking sub. That's like a submarine. That's not even a goddamn jet ski. You got a speedboat. You got speedboat money, dude. Um, thanks. Um, that's all I got. Juice, do you have any? Um, we did drop a new mini episode this week on Patreon. That's right. Um, we did. I was talking about Love, Death, and Robots uh, Season 2. Um, so that if you support us on the $10 level on Patreon, you get uh, bonus episodes each month. And that is the newest one that just dropped. And um, other than that, though, I think that's all my housekeeping. Sweet. I think our houses are collectively clean. This house is clean. Without further ado, let's get into the main event. We're talking Candy Man from 2021. We're kicking it off with the back of the box. What's on the back of the box? <laughs> All right, there is no box yet, um, so I don't yet. actually have it to read yet. Yet, um, but yeah, we're talking about the new Candy Mang for 2021, runtime of an hour and 31 minutes. Uh, this was directed by Nia DeCosta. Uh, this was co-written by Jordan Peele and uh, Win Rosenfield and Nia DeCosta, produced by uh, Jordan Peele and his company uh, Monkey Paul. Um, plot synopsis here, as brought to you by IMDb, is a sequel to the horror film Candyman from 1992 that returns to the now gentrified Chicago neighborhood where the legend began. Uh, obviously, this is a new movie, first time watch for all of us. Uh, let's go around real quick and uh, answer the age old question. Would you recommend people check this out? Randy, kick us off. Uh, yeah, I would. Um, I think that this, uh, <clears throat> any, I, I think that this, for the most part, lives up to what you would want to see in a Candyman uh, sequel in current year. Um, I think that I don't know. I don't want to go too deep into it, really. I think that I mean it's it's not um, even less so than the original. It fits the slasher rubric a little bit less. Um, but you know, I don't know what people are going into this movie thinking it is necessarily. If they're not terribly familiar with the original, I don't think they'll be shocked by that. And even if they have are familiar with the original. The original was never leaning too heavily on that trope anyway. So I think that this is for horror fans and for fans of the original is going to be going to be a pretty good movie for them for the most part. Right on. Uh, Nicole, what about you? Uh, I would also recommend um, for me. I think that what I expected is what I got. Um, so definitely if you know you're intrigued by the original Candyman, and if the trailer looked promising to you, I would say that it's a, uh, it's probably to safe, safe just to dive right in. So yeah, definitely would recommend. All right, Juice, what about you? Before I do my recommend, I wanted to, in honor of Candyman and the spooky season tonight, me and Bob are pounding uh, pumpkin pie Kit Kats over here, which are decorated indie <laughs> individuals. <laughs> yeah, indies. Um, Fun size and. and some candy corn so spooky season full swing candy man like to point out that they did not share with the class <laughs> <laughs> um as far as candy man goes 2021 i would recommend people check out this new candy man um i'm excited at the possibility that this new candy man it's it feels maybe a little more accessible and something that we talked about last year in kind of going back over the original candy man is it's kind of like not as well known um, especially in like in the horror genres, you got your classics of, you know, Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street and stuff. And Candyman is a great horror film that like sometimes gets grouped in with slashers, but it's kind of its own thing. I think the success of this movie is really going to bring that to the forefront. It, it feels like a more accessible um, type of Candyman. And I'm excited that possibility because I also don't think you need to watch the first Candyman to appreciate this film. I think they did a pretty good job of setting it up for newcomers as well. So if you if you're not familiar with the Candyman franchise, I would say still go check this out because it's just like some solid theater horror for theater horror for 2021. Um, so yeah, I would recommend people check it out. Bob, yo, would you recommend Candyman 2021? Yeah, overall, I would recommend this movie. I think it um, if you have a passing interest in Candyman. 
Um, whether you've seen the original or not, I think you'll probably get a kick out of this movie. Um, it's it's visually stunning, and I know right now it's only in theaters, and there's like still a pandemic going on. Um, if you feel safe going to the theater to watch it, I would say yeah, go ahead and do it. Um, if you don't, I'm sure it'll be on VOD within a month or so. I don't know, like you know. So uh, I, I'm sure you won't have to wait too long. Overall, I think it's worth watching, and we'll get into why. Um, Sounds like a decent recommendation from the whole squad here. Uh, slam your eyeballs into it. Uh, but we are going to spoil the shit out of this movie. And here goes that spoiler warning. Oh, man. This one's still broken. Oh. Uh, <laughs> spoiler warning! There you go. I got you, dog. <laughs> Thanks, man. You covered for me. Hey, cool. you have now been warned. Um, in, in, in honor of that. Pumpkins. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't have to wait Daddy long. gives you what you need. <laughs> oh, Diddy. Um, I do have the plot synopsis typed up. It's a little bit lengthy, but I'll read. Oh, oh Bob. These past couple of weeks, these plot synopsis. Hey, last right. week was Randy. Yeah, I know. That wasn't on me. Oh, my Lord. One day I'll do the plot synopsis. One day, but that's. I'm sure it'll be never perfect. Gonna happen. Never gonna sure. No happen. notes. All right. Uh, so we got. Our main character, Anthony McCoy, he's a visual artist living with his girlfriend and art gallery director, Brianna Cartwright, in the now gentrified Cabrini Green, Chicago. Uh, Brianna's brother shares the urban legend of Helen Lyle, who went on a killing spree in the 90s that culminated in her attempt to throw a child into a bonfire in Cabrini Green. Uh, the child was saved and Helen herself burned in the fire. Uh, Anthony clings to this folklore and hopes for a creative spark uh, he speaks with a local laundromat owner, William Burke, who tells him about a harrowing childhood experience he had regarding a, a hooked man named Sherman Fields, who used to give candy to children. Uh, young William was startled by Sherman crawling out of a hole in the wall in Cabrini Green, causing him to yell out and alert the cops. William then witnesses the cops beat Sherman to death for passing out candy with razor blades in them. After Sherman's death, uh, children were still somehow getting candy with razor blades. The legend goes, if you say Candyman five times while looking in the mirror, you will conjure the ghost of Sherman and he will kill you. Uh, inspired by this, Anthony creates an art installation uh, that is featured in his girlfriend's gallery. Uh, Brianna's co-worker and an intern eventually look into the mirror. They say um, Candyman five times and they are brutally murdered. Uh, news of the murder um, causes sudden interest in Anthony's work. Uh, this leads to him having an interview with an art critic at her apartment. Uh, she is then also brutally murdered. Uh, there is then a group of high school students who decide to test out the Candyman legend in their school bathroom and are all murdered. Uh, Anthony gets stung on the hand by a bee, causing a horrible reaction uh, that begins spreading up his arm. He goes to the hospital to have it looked at and finds out his mom lied about the hospital he was born in. He goes to ask his mom about it and finds out that he was the baby Helen allegedly tried to sacrifice in the 90s. Uh, his mother then further explains Candyman was trying to sacrifice him in the fire. Helen helped save him. Uh, Brianna, trying to find Anthony, speaks with William, the laundromat owner, and uh, he ends up uh, abducting her and taking her to an abandoned church in Cabrini Green. Anthony's there and his body is further deteriorated. William cuts off his hand and gives him a hook and jacket. William then explains uh, when he was a child, he also saw his sister summon Candyman in the mirror and she was then killed. Uh, William now plans uh, for Anthony to be gunned down by the police, creating a whole new legend in which Candyman will then be used for vengeance rather than just a symbol of pain. Uh, Brianna ends up escaping. She's chased by William into a row house with Brie Green, uh, where she stabs him to death. Anthony then appears in Brianna's arms and is ultimately shot to death by the cops. Brianna is handcuffed, put into the back of the police car. A uh, cop is trying to convince Brianna to agree that Anthony provoked the police to shoot him. Uh, she agrees to say whatever they want as long as she can see herself in the rear view mirror. The cop angles the mirror for her. She says Candyman five times. Anthony then appears as the new Candyman. He murders all the cops. Uh, more cops are on the way, and Candyman then turns into uh, the original Candyman, uh, Daniel Robitaille, and instructs Brianna to, Brianna to uh, tell everyone. Roll credits. Sorry for the lengthy ass explanation, but that is the plot of the film. It's okay. It's not too bad. Uh, there's a lot of lore in the original, and I think something that this movie does fairly well is weave all of that lore into it, um, and like it sort of pays respect to it, but also does its own thing here. 
my initial watch of the, of the movie, I think I was responding really positively towards that. Like when we find out he's the baby, um, I was like, oh, that's kind of a nice touch. And then we also get like flashes of him uh, listening to tapes that were recorded in the original. And like, I don't know, I thought that was all handled with care. Um, I don't know, how did you guys feel about the integration of the original lore in this movie? I think I, that it was, sorry, you go ahead. Go ahead. No, <laughs> I um I thought it was handled really well also. Um, whenever we first met um, the initial Candyman um, from when Burke was a kid, I was a little bit like not sure what was, where we were going to go, you know? Mm -hmm. I was like, the look of this guy is really cool and the story is kind of neat, but I was like, are we completely changing it? Like, what's going to happen? So whenever um, we get the more in-depth explanation about how, you know, Daniel Robitaille was the first, but Candyman is this, like, bigger overarching, like, spirit and concept and that you know it's it's like he was one part of a whole i was like okay this actually sort of cleans up some of the confusion from the lore of the first one and expands on it which i feel like usually sequels when they expand on things it gets messy and it's not great um and i think this is a rare exception where it's like okay this really feels like we're getting a deeper glimpse into the world without making it more complicated yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that like with the sequels we got in like the original two sequels we got, um, whatever lore was involved was heavily skewed towards like expanding upon Robitaille's journey and mm -hmm. what his interest is in whoever he's hunting at the moment, um, which, you know, is makes sense because at the time you had Freddy and that was what they did with Freddy. That's what they did with Jason to some extent. Like there was a lot of that going around with the slashers at the time and he was kind of trying to make up, sh set up shop as the the slasher uh of cabrini green you know what i mean so um i think that that's true and i think that this movie does a great job in sort of like patching those things up adding to the lore without focusing too much with while focusing really more on the main themes of the original without focusing too much on expanding upon you know kind of fluffy things that are about robotai himself that makes sense yeah, one thing I mentioned too in my recommendation is I liked that they didn't like they gave some info dumps, but it at least was done stylistically, um, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just info dumps like Bob had mentioned. We get the tapes of Helen doing her thing, you know, later in the thing. But I love the puppets, and it even made this story a little more interesting and intriguing where they were going to take the lore to a, a further step i loved the interpretation of the first one because we see it through helen's vision watching the first film but in this one you get how everyone else would experience it and it seems like she was possessed or she went crazy and things like that mm -hmm. and it really kind of gives this much darker feeling feeling like spin on it and it kind of sets us up for maybe the journey that this new character of anthony is going to go on which he kind of does and i thought that that was handled really well i i was very impressed with how smooth that all seemed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, the thing that i was like a little bit like i don't know if this I, I don't know if this is necessarily a ding but like the way that they promoted this movie um like one of the first trailers we got, I don't remember what, if it was the teaser or one of the, like the first full length trailer was basically the exposition of through those paper dolls that we see interspersed throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. So first of all, that's one of the best things I saw last year. I'll stand by that as being one of the best trailers I've ever seen. And I loved it. It was just beautiful. And it was like clearly drawing upon the work of Kara Walker and like pulling on art historical stuff and fitting it really seamlessly with this, this topic that they're going for. Um, and I wasn't sure how much of that was actually going to be in the film. They integrated into the film. I will say that watching it in the theater didn't have as much of an impact because I was already familiar with them playing with those things. Yeah. So it kind of came at a cost, but I think it was a worthy cost. And I think that um, the I the way that they, but I think that like having that in the film was such a great way to show Helen's journey. Um, they you know they talk about it as well. They do a brief sort of like campfire tale but they also show it in this puppetry form and then show similar stories to robotai and that really it goes a long goddamn way in illustrating yeah. the idea that this is a hive of people possessed within the candy man you know robotai world his hive 
Yeah. It was also nice that we didn't have to, like, watch Daniel Robitaille's, like, whole, like, ordeal again because we've seen Mm -hmm. it in every other movie. So Mm -hmm. the fact that they chose to tell the story in a different way, I thought was really, really smart because it felt fresh. And it also is like, because this movie is suddenly, this is, as opposed to going in micro and looking at Robitaille, this movie goes macro and goes outward. Uh, you get more, like I said, it was it, it really kind of leans more into the theme. You don't have Helen as a love interest kind of thing, like there being like some sort of unspoken historical love between them or somebody who looks like her, or like any of that, you know, Dracula stuff going on. It doesn't have that. And it replaces it instead with just a heavy laser focus on the larger issues at hand, at play, which are, you know, people getting lynched, black dudes getting lynched primarily, and uh, the Candyman being sort of like a spiritual outpouring of that violence that lingers around, um, and just kind of grows that. I would say pretty organically. I've heard a lot of people say this movie is uh, not subtle, which I would. I would agree to some extent like it it does it's not subtle with those themes you know and I don't think it has to be though I think it's effective with those themes the way that they're portrayed is I don't know you have instead of a love Helen as a love you know figure of love you have um Anthony who is a tortured artist and I like that Mm -hmm. as a different kind of angle a different approach to this because Robitaille was an artist sorry so it directly ties them together in that way and also allows a lot of conversation about like i'm sure nicole you have thoughts about how the art world was portrayed in this film yeah i uh (laughs) you know i i I appreciated it because um first of all uh i'm sure that you were very excited that we once again got real art in this movie (laughs) i was very excited that there was it was not a photoshop filter yes on a canvas yeah we got and we saw some really cool stuff too especially those giant portraits in his studio like that was really yeah. great um but yeah i it it gave me it reminded me of velvet buzzsaw which i don't know if you guys have seen that one but yeah 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 like it, it was, i haven't good seen shirt. it but it's 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 interesting um because it's in the same way it's you know kind of critical of of these like pretentious the whole pretentious world and just the whole scene and so yeah i i definitely appreciated that and um and i think kind of the contrast of the super glossy art gallery with the little primitive you know shadow puppets was was kind of like we sort of got like the whole scope and you know the little handmade shadow puppets felt very like authentic and genuine as compared to this like pretentious art world you know well yeah and that's the thing is like i think they used it to a narrative advantage too because Mm -hmm. they like as opposed to you know like they give anthony gets a lot of shit in this movie as an artist as being Mm -hmm. mediocre or whatever the thing he puts together is not bad in my opinion i think it was kind of cool um but you know they there's not a lot of everybody's so hypercritical and so hyper focused like you know it, it the the whole idea of what is the value of art and what makes art valuable like that's always at the fore of my mind when I see this sort of thing portrayed. I haven't seen Velvet Buzzsaw, but I understand that it's a pretty satirical take. And I think they yeah. kind of did that here, but they kind of did that to the to comment, I think, on the idea of exploitation of you know black men's work in the world over like historically speaking. You know, this is somebody who you know his biggest problem, the reason that they don't want that that he's not you know a beloved art figure that he has trouble selling his art is because he's not uh, putting enough pain of his own pain and historical trauma into the fucking artwork. It's when he starts doing that, that it starts getting a little bit interesting, but Mm -hmm. then he's like, it comes at the ultimate cost for him. He loses his fucking soul. So (laughs) I don't know. Like, I, I think that that's a pretty interesting sort of subtext or subplot going on in this. That's like an extra commentary on top of the commentary that we expected based on the trailers. I did. That was one of the things that I saw as, a a little bit of a critique of this film is that in in approaching a smooth way to kind of bring this candy mang into like a new era it felt like they needed to almost explain everything 
And so in our discussion last year, there's a lot of interesting kind of just choices about the first Candyman, the way he dresses that aren't really explained. The way he dresses, there's this huge focus on art and that it's not really like tied to any character. It's just prominent throughout the film. And one of my critiques about even going back to bringing this new Candyman in um, is it's it was too convenient there's this guy from the 70s who also wears this coat and has a hook on his hand just like the guy you know from the 1800s and then that's the guy we're going to follow it was almost like this we're not going to have tony todd in but we need somebody who represents this look of candy mang so we're going to explain it in this way and in the same way it felt like we also need to tie in the importance of art from the first candy man because we do see one of the uh, like i think when they go back into the church we see more of that kind of graffiti style that i like how they addressed was kind of you know gentrified over as the church was all painted off you see the old school thing but at the same time it was like that was one of the negative representations of Candyman. it's like he was kept alive through this lore through this like amazing looking art but it was also you know kind of embedding this devil into the community but it just felt like they almost needed to explain everything from the original candy Mang, and i was like sometimes it felt a little too much to mm. me i feel like you know I, I complimented this movie earlier about how it does a really great job at integrating the lore from the original movie i think they spend too much time on that and not enough time on what they're bringing fresh to the to the movie into the franchise to where like the second half of the movie specifically the ending feels super rushed and mm. i feel like what they're trying to turn candy man into is like almost kind of glossed over in a way. Like it's very rare that, I, that I'd say on this podcast, like I wish I had another 15, 20 minutes with this yeah, movie. That is a uh, rare bird indeed. But I really feel that way. I think it would have done this movie um, some justice. Cause like, you know, you, you're right in that when you say juice that like there's this convenient like guy in 1977, Cabrini Green, he's got a hook and a jacket and he's handing out candy. And like we do get glimpses of like Daniel Robitaille in early artwork and then also at the very end of the movie when we finally do see Tony Todd for a second. But like other than that, every time we see Candyman, it's it's Sherman from 1977 and he's mm -hmm. floating around killing people. Um, and then at the very end, we get Anthony who becomes the new Candyman for like a couple minutes and then we get a flash of Tony Todd. And it's just very confusing that it's kind of bouncing around the way that it is bouncing around. I feel like ultimately Tony Todd at the end was just like fan service which I, it was cool to see him but if they're going to do that I almost wish like we didn't see Sherman killing people I wish it was just always Tony Todd killing people if you're going to have him in at all you see, know I kind of I would disagree with that actually and it's not that you know that couldn't work but to me yeah. it's like you've I feel like I first of all I want to say that I really loved the the guy doing whatever the, the 70s candy man like yeah. his look he like, looked yeah. he played yeah. that shit yeah terrifyingly yeah <laughs> like huge kudos to him every shot of him was fucking terrifying i love the um, choice to have him float too i thought that was a really yes. nice touch. Yeah. yeah yeah and just the way he like crawled out of the hole like everything every like the way that was directed mm -hmm. was just so good and yeah. you know i i understand like i i think to your point i could have lived with seeing maybe a few more shots of other people's version of Candyman, yeah. which we saw like a few like kind of glimpses right at the end, right before it turned to Tony Todd. But I also think that the the, the shadow puppets kind of did that for us and leaves the mystery open for future groundwork to be laid in other stories. So I don't, if, if they do that, which I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm never super on board with continuing these sort of things, but <laughs> if yeah. they do, that gives them a lot, like a wealth of things to pull from, I think. Something that I was, some I heard uh, uh, Jordan Peele say, and I'm definitely going to be like kind of paraphrasing here. I think we talked about this a little bit when we were doing the series with on your show, Nicole, as well. Is like given that uh, like Candyman is who he is, like he's a wrongfully persecuted black man who was like tortured and murdered, um, really mm -hmm. essentially for not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's just uh, you know, and then he like comes comes back and, and murders people at Cabrini Green in the 90s and Jordan Peele was talking about this concept and how like given who he is and, and like how he becomes Candyman why would he then go to the projects and and kill a bunch of poor black people like it makes more sense 
that he would kill like super vengeance. rich white folks because yeah, yeah seek yeah. seek vengeance or whatever so like that going into this movie that's sort of what i was expecting to see a lot more of and i feel like they get to that at the very end i was just sort of like shocked that that wasn't the whole movie and ultimately i wish it would have been a more consistent theme i think it would have made a stronger story ultimately well if you notice though he doesn't kill any black people until the very end when Burke sees his sister get killed. Yes, I was mm -hmm. going to say, that's the one I remember. But up until that point, everybody who dies is white. And I was like, I feel like this is a very specific choice. I agree. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it's like, because there were so many little issues with the 90s version. And that was, I mean, people have been saying mm -hmm. for so long, like, why in the world would he come here and terrorize his own people? So I definitely feel like it was a huge step for them to be like, okay, we're just going to like write the ship here. Well, and I, this is something I disagree with on Bob in that one thing I like the choice that this one made that kind of it maybe explains that first one without having to kind of tear it down almost in my mind is that he haunts this area mm -hmm. and so i like the idea especially with the school where he is he was killed and tortured in cabrini green and we you see in a whole ton of like possession or haunting movies or you know that kind of pain it, it takes over this area and i know that changes maybe the second one where he goes to new orleans or whatever but from the first one it's like why would he come to the projects to terrorize these black people what's well, like well that's just where he is it's cabrini green it's I'm about like, yeah. this area it's about this neighborhood so when it becomes gentrified i like that it's like <laughs> <laughs> they these people don't know what they're fucking getting into you know the people in the projects have had to live with this demon this devil for decades and now people are trading it you know like this fun little story these girls are getting slaughtered in their preppy high school and so i'm like i like that idea and i think it it serves as a way to take the first one and make it make sense but also to kind of write the ship at the same time mm -hmm. i so to add on to that like that's a, that's a fair point, but it, the movie also doesn't seem to keep that consistent. Because um, at the very end of the movie, like whenever she conjures Candyman, it seems like so Candyman is just going to kill whoever conjures him. Uh, but she's still regardless, like a green, green. Regardless of color. I know, but she conjures Candyman and he just only kills all the cops and not I think her. that's and a reflection her. of, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. I was, my point is, it just seems like the lore is still a little inconsistent and confused, ultimately. Um, I would that, argue that you guys are both kind of right. Because, like, yeah. I mean, I think that, like, you know, the idea, like, we know that Candyman can go other places. He goes to New Orleans. He goes to, what was it, Chicago, this, the other one? Or no, uh, L.A. Chicago. What am I talking about? L.A. LA. Yes, thank you. And um, so, like, we know he gets around, even in the first movie, at, like, when they're setting up the lore, they're like, in cities all over America, there have these situations happen. Like they say that. So like, he's not limited to Cabrini Green, but the fact that he, the trauma started there has something to do with it, I think. And mm -hmm. even in this movie, you have, um, I can't remember the guy's name, the laundromat guy. He uh, well, says yeah. something to the effect of, you know, when you have all these tragedies stacking up on each other, you try and clean the stain, you try and clean the stain, but eventually a tear forms. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what's happening here. And to, uh, and kind of as a total aside i wanted to bring up those you know preppy white girls in school because i loved the way that that was shot this is strictly just mm. like a hilarious thing that they chose to do which is you know i think that you know having the graffiti and all that stuff whitewashed over quite literally because things are being gentrified but also that everybody agreed not to talk about candy man anymore after mm -hmm. little anthony was returned mm -hmm. i think that robbed him of his power as we know that's the source of his power is the fear of him um, and so later on, they're talking about like, you know, these people have died or whatever it's in the news. And, um, it's, it's Anthony's wife and his, or girlfriend and his, her brother are talking and she's, he's like, you know, people are going to start summoning him again or something. She's like, who would be stupid enough to do that? Cut to white girl in high <laughs> yeah. school. And I'm like, of course that's fucking, who's going to do it? People who, yeah. you know, who, who don't have the frame of reference for that necessarily, and who are comfortable in, enough in their spot to not fear the idea of summoning things. Oh, he, mm -hmm. the, the brother also says, you know, black people don't need to be summoning shit, which <laughs> is a hilarious line. And, you know, kind of 
speaks to the thesis or to the themes, mm-hmm. I think, in that way. It's like these are people that, you know, I, I, within the world of Candyman, certainly are they they are they know better. They have seen the results of what doing that is. And even if they don't believe it, they're not going to tempt fate because they've seen, you know, shit crash down for lesser things in the past. So That's true, but Anthony doesn't follow that. Like he tempts fate. He's the reason that Candyman comes back, you know? Well, I think he's an acolyte that like, I don't know, like that's kind of an issue that I have. If I have any, is that I don't really understand his motivation other than he was psychologically broken by the death of his sister. That's the only thing I can think of Um, because he's clearly got like the most information and the most frame of reference. No, no, no. I'm talking about our main character. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I got the names (laughs) confused. I'm sorry. (laughs) Never mind. Strike so, that. That yeah. So that seems like kind of inconsistent. And I mean, obviously, he's he's like a struggling artist, and he's he's like investing himself into uh, what turns out to be the neighborhood that he was born in, which you yeah. know, un- unbeknownst mm-hmm. to him, um, which is kind of interesting. That like, I guess in the '90s movie, um, Candyman almost like marked him, you know, tried to sacrifice him, and then you know he came back, and then he gets stung by the bee, and then it's all downhill from there. He starts unraveling. Well, th- that's something I like to talk about. That mm-hmm. I. I... And I don't know if it's just built into this character that maybe it just from the offset was too convoluted. But one thing, again, kind of coming back to what this movie maybe suffers from a little bit, is it feels like there's a lot of very intriguing threads for me. And I really enjoyed the ride. But once I start pulling on these individual threads, Mm -hmm. I feel like the ending for me didn't kind of land on any of those threads. And in the end, they kind of turned out to be nothing or not important. And so one of those threads is about this kind of idea of Candyman possessing or infecting people. So there's the, I, they, they plant this seed in your mind, again, like I said, which I liked, of, of the interpretation of Helen. You know, people are seeing this woman and they're saying she's insane, you know, like, oh, my God. And he even asked the question, why would somebody snap like that? And it's, you know, foreshadowing what's going to happen to the man who's asking this question because he's tempting the same kind of fate, the same idea. And yet the thing that they want to hammer home, though, is that Candyman is built out of this tragedy. He's built out of this thing. And yet this boy was chosen and, he, and mm-hmm. it wasn't a natural, like he was abused by, you know, the cops or anything like that on the offset. It's like Candyman chose and infected him through nothing that he, he was out taking pictures and got a bee sting and was, and which is kind of the same thing that happened with Helen. It's like she, you know, she was just kind of getting into it and was chosen and almost infected. But in the lore that this movie tries to set up, like with Sherman in the seventies, it's like, oh, it's, it's. You become Candyman through your own trauma and tragedy in the community. And like, then you take on the mantle kind mm-hmm. of Candyman. That's not what happened to our character. I mean, ultimately in the end, they try to like shoehorn mm-hmm. that in, but through the whole journey, that's not what's happening. Mm-hmm. I like that idea of him being infected, especially in the same way, again, like how they tied it in with Helen, but the ending just didn't sit right with me about this guy in the community like forcing this hook on his hand and putting the jacket on him i was like what it felt very forced and not a satisfying ending to me so before we go further i really would like to go back and like kind of revisit um what i think i can't remember who brought up earlier about just the sort of the social commentary and the message in this movie because i feel like it's super important to like uh, pretty much everything in this movie. Um, so I definitely, and I want to be like kind of careful about how I f- like phrase the way I feel about this, but um, I did feel that the message was really put first and foremost in a lot of the dialogue where it could have it could have been handled a lot more artfully. Um, and I thought that it was a hindrance to the overall movie. Um, because I think the concept and the message are great, but I just felt like it was like, almost like they were looking at you like, we want to make sure that we say this in the dialogue that this is bad and this is bad and this is bad. And they they didn't just do it once. I mean, it was like several times. And, um, that was really distracting for me. Um, and I thought I was like, but, but again, I was like, okay, the filmmakers, 
there, we've got black filmmakers. You know, we're living this really tumultuous time. Um, they're taking back possession of this black story. So I was trying to like sit there and think, okay, like I want to like give grace for the like the people who are telling this story. This is their story. Um, and one of the things that I've thought about after just sitting with it for several days is, um, you know, the past what year, year and a half, we've we've heard a lot about Black Lives Matter. We've seen, you know, all of the police brutality and stuff in the news. So like we've heard it and we've seen it over and over and over and over and over again. And so to then have it just said point blank to us again in a movie feels like, yeah, we all know this. Like this feels really clunky. Um, but then I remembered, OK, this movie was supposed to come out in June of 2020, which means it was filmed and written well before uh, George Floyd's death, which was May of 20, 2020. Yeah. yeah. And I thought maybe who, when they were writing this and filming it, they were like, we don't want to just skirt around this. We want to make sure that we say what we mean. Um, because that's another kind of criticism I've heard about 92 is that, you know, they address some of these issues and they kind of walk right up to the line, but mm -hmm. never really say anything about it. Um, so overall, I feel kind of conflicted about it because I feel like it's a problem for me creatively. But when I think about the context of when it was written and who wrote it and why they wrote it, um, I have a little bit more grace for it because I'm like, it actually seems like it might have been just right ahead of its time. And now it seems obvious to us just because of what we've lived through in the past year. I think that's a good point. And I also think that I kind of skew towards the second uh, interpretation. Like, yeah, I think that this movie is not super subtle with its theming. That's absolutely true. But I also mm -hmm. think there's a value to being forthright uh, when you're talking about something that is very pressing and i gotta think that especially after this last year these are still pressing issues mm -hmm. and any, i don't think anybody's going to see the candy man movie uh without expecting some social commentary mm -hmm. that is applicable to today uh so I, to me i feel like that's i don't have a problem with it like seeming maybe a little more clunky or it leaning a, a little harder into it than you might have because like you said like in, in 92 it's like you know it, they, it was a great movie and it's still a great movie. I think it's still better than this movie, but I think that it also, it pulled a punch in some way. And I think there's some value to putting out a movie, especially when it's a mainstream movie that is heavily, you know, advertised, that's going to get a lot of butts and seats that says these things outright, you know, and especially because, you know, at the time, like you said, it was not really being talked about at least not on the level that we've seen in this last year and a half. And I, I think that even dis even regarding that, even that in not mind, I think there's still a value to being as forthright about the story you're telling. These themes are the story. Like this, this is a, this is a movie about generational trauma. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how you skirt that issue. Um, I mean, you can be artful about it, but I be more artful with it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I also, I, the, the other side of that is like, fuck this, fuck subtlety, <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> Let's well, one one it. thing that I think um, was a, a subtle, artful thing, which I may be reading too much into this. Like, you guys can just tell me if you think I'm way off base here. But um, David and I were talking about um, his bee sting and how, like, I mean, it got infected, like, pretty much right away. But David was like, why didn't he go to the doctor sooner? Like, he said, everybody saw it. And like everybody saw how bad it was. Why didn't anybody say anything? Like, why didn't anybody do anything? And I thought, oh my gosh. I was like, is the is his yeah. like bee sting and his super infected arm, is this like a commentary on racism yeah. and nobody doing anything when they see it? I was like, I don't know, that might be a reach, but that was like a subtle thing to me that I thought I wish they would have done more of that stuff where you had to dig a little bit, you know. Well, the only people really concerned about that is is his fiance, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it takes a long time, though. I did. I want to <laughs> want to take this. Moment. This was an amazing moment in the theater that I want to set up <laughs> since you're mentioning it. I was sitting I right was next going. to Shaboy Bob over here. Shaboy. And I it was a great moment as it, it's it's a great moment for horror in this movie to take it outside just the slasher realm because it became this almost like body horror. 
as it creeps up his arm. Yeah. But when he's in the cathedral and he's literally full of holes, Bob Ooh. lost his <laughs> shit because Bob's got that fear of holes. I think I felt that. Yes. And it was so oh. perfectly set up to where I was like, oh man, that looks gnarly. But I mean, it affected Bob physically. <laughs> he melted and just- <laughs> I covered <laughs> my eyes. I could not look at this screen. <laughs> I, I like felt it like for a couple hours after the movie It like, so it's, it's a phobia called trypophobia. It's a fear of holes. It's, it's, I don't it's know. a fear of holes. It's shit fucking is disgusting. It's like the worst shit ever for me to look at in the world. And it affects me very physically. I was not ready for it. Um, so that's like probably the scariest scene of any movie I'm going to watch this year. Like, um, like catered to your fear it. basis. It, it is fucking <laughs> heinous and really, really, really bothering But between me. that and Tooth Guy, I mean, you really, you really got it coming from both ends. Yeah. Um, so I did want to praise that, though, because that was super effective for anyone mm -hmm. who has that fear. But even for me, I was like, oh, that's super gnarly looking. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the way it crept up his arm and then overtook his face. <laughs> it was it was a great way, though to kind of tie in the idea of the bees because again yeah the original mm -hmm. game it just has so many things kind of thrown at the wall that they really did try to make as many things make sense or tie it in um and that's one of the positives that i think it had except it didn't really make sense it's like why is this guy becoming infected and why is he turning into a beehive if you become Candyman through generational trauma, like we talked about through these institutional mm -hmm. practices, that doesn't really fall in line. Like there are these two roads and they're trying to make them intersect and they don't. And yeah. so that's, it's problematic in its overall world building and logic, but in like, as a, as a mechanic, it works because it looks gross it kind of works with the idea of the bees because it looks kind of like honeycomb, but in the idea of you're created as a, you know, as a candy man through this trauma, then that doesn't really make sense. See, I, I mean, I, the generational trauma thing, like, I don't think that that's explicitly stated as being the cause of any candy man situation. I think that what? Mm, it's the cause of no. the original. Yeah. And it's yeah, the cause of no, Sherman. no, that's, that's just a, that's a direct murder. I think that is a, that's an allegory for generational trauma, but I don't think it's saying that generational trauma itself is what's causing it. This is all allegorical. But I'm saying, I'm saying in the way that like, it's even, I mean, in the puppets in the end, it said all of these, the way that Anthony is tied to all these different candy, like the caveman is the hive is they all go through some kind of like abuse, like, like the original Candyman. So you're talking about physical Sherman abuse, was. not so much the generational. Well, abuse. yeah, I guess that through the, uh, what okay. I meant is through that, that the you generation. Have a yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay, I see what you mean then. Okay. Yeah, I really thought we were going to get the Night of the Living Dead ending where he gets shot ultimately because they think he's a threat. Like, mm -hmm. and that's where when you guys were talking about like the ending not 100% matching up, like I also didn't understand why Laundry Mat guy was like an integral part of the whole thing because. Um, it's like if he had just, if he had set it up so that, I don't know, it's just, I feel like it, they could have easily had, Anthony's already a suspect, so yeah. I feel like it would have been easy to set it up in a more simple way where he just gets shot because they assume he's the killer, you know, and then by default then I becomes think they really man. wanted to get I, that that hook in that hand you know what I, I mean? mean it was <laughs> it was really great it was great but yeah <laughs> I, mean, I i just didn't understand his motivation one of the things that justin and i were discussing a little bit earlier before the show was like this movie is set up in a way where like people are dying specifically associated with anthony's art so yeah. people around anthony are dying so yeah. you would assume that eventually the cops would connect the dots and be like, hey, we need to look into this artist because people around him and his art are dying. And then eventually in the end, it would turn out that he is unwillingly being turned into a candy man and then they would kill him. And it's really not his fault. Like right. it's, it's all heading in that direction and then they don't do that. And instead, uh, yeah, William like forces him to become Candyman and then and gets shot. And then it seems like Candyman is then now being wielded 
instead of just like killing whoever conjures him like you can conjure him to like do your bidding almost in the end so i read a theory about why she didn't get killed by the way and it made sense to me that basically um they're always like there's always kind of like a, a witness to the incident mm -hmm. who then tell has to carry the story to the community and that because she's the witness, like she's the one who has to now go tell the community about Candyman. So he doesn't want to kill her because if he kills her, who's going to spread his story, basically? Um, and I was like, that makes sense to me. I also yeah. think that there's a component of, you that know, Anthony sense. being part of the hive now. Yeah. Maybe his, maybe his feelings towards her are integrated into that somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that, ma that makes a, like a pretty good logical sense to me. Actually, that, that scene was beautiful, by the way. That does actually make a lot of sense in what they try to show you because I was like, why did, why did they even need to show the little girl, the sister of, oh God, uh, what's William? The, William. William why did they even need to show that happening? And why would he want that to come back? Because it seemed like he witnessed his sister get murdered by Candyman. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with any kind of institution or any kind of like abuse. He literally witnessed her performing the ritual and being killed. So why would he mm -hmm. want that to take place in the thing? But if that is true in just the general lore of someone needs to kind of care, because he is the one who brings this kind of candy man back. He's the one who yeah. tells Anthony mm -hmm. about it. So that actually, yeah, He's that actually bear. is helpful mm -hmm. in a couple different ways. Hmm. Well, and, and you know, the... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the scene where he is basically a witness to Sherman's death, like the way that's shot, like it's really clear that he's super upset by it. I mean, he basically mm -hmm, hears mm -hmm. a man get beat to death. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's really conflicted because he was afraid of this man and he screamed because he was afraid, which brought the cops in. So it, he probably feels like this is kind of my fault. And then he hears this man get beat to death. So I feel like that was the beginning maybe of his just trauma and then later mm -hmm. when his sister gets taken out i mean i feel like that all has just you know sort of contributed to his being I, where he's I at think and how he's, he's like psychologically broken and you know the, yeah. the thing is though like to, to one thing that's incongruous maybe with that is if we're going with the idea that you know candy man needs a witness candy man needs a torchbearer to carry out his you know his name his legacy um then I would think that, like, there, there's they specifically show um, that particular Candyman to William Burke, both the first incident and the incident with his sister. He shushes him. So if that's what they're saying, then I feel like the shushing they, that's probably incongruous with what they're trying to say. If that is indeed the the intention, yeah. Um, so that doesn't necessarily work because you you don't want him to be quiet about it. You you want him to tell everyone. That's the that's the point, right? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. But he also, the first time he did that, he did that as a, at least as I, we assume, some sort of sentient person of his own, unless he yeah. was already under some sort of some sort of spell or whatever from Candyman. He was operating himself, and he shushed him so that he wouldn't be caught, you know, because he was being hunted by police. Right. So, I mean, maybe it was just a callback to that, but it kind of yeah. like runs counter to what we're talking about. Well, see, and that's the thing that, like, if they showed the original Sherman and maybe he had some kind of markings on him, like he was also infected, because then you could even ride the idea of the kind of a meta of like a physical metaphor of this generational trauma where the original candy man this happened to him unfortunately and in a way his pain like reaches out generation to generation and grabs a man like himself and starts to transform in the way kind of like in the metaphor you said like oh the race and like people just ignore and it kind of starts to take over somebody and then as a result you know that makes them disfigured or that affects how they look and like i don't know kind of tying in those ideas but there was nothing like the whole infection idea of anthony i think is is problematic in in the lore um because they even set that up in the same way as helen helen was you know possessed she was infected or whatever but that has nothing to do with this this narrative that they're now pushing in the new form of Candyman of sherman of that like no it's formed through trauma no it's formed through abuse and so mm -hmm. like there's a disconnect well, there for me 
let's i, I want to point this out real quick because there is like there is a generational trauma is a specific concept so i want to point out what that is and what i'm talking about when i say that is the idea of so this is like something that's been studied in like holocaust people children of holocaust survivors things like that people who did not experience the trauma firsthand but through storytelling and in some scientific studies they've made correlations to literal like altering of dna in children based on the trauma of the parents so that's what's being talked about when you talk about generational trauma that second part the biological aspect is i think far more in question but the idea of being raised by somebody who teaches you outright to fear x y and z because x y and z horrible thing happened to them is undeniable like that's and mm-hmm. i think that's that's really what the movie is about more than anything i think that the direct like lynching and things is kind of like that's the pimple popping but the pimple has to grow do you know what i mean <laughs> like there, this is something like and i think that's what's being played out with the bee sting i don't think even helen went through something quite so similar she was entranced as a lover you know what i mean and and Mm -hmm. that was kind of a special case the same way that anthony i think is a special case because he was marked as a baby i think he's just wandered back into the maw of the beast unwittingly gets stung and then gets caught up in this situation that he by all accounts should have been able to remove himself from as somebody who never specifically experienced the trauma himself but his mother did (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. like and he's been Mm -hmm. like her fear and like and came through him in some way and it's you know the effects of being somebody who's trying to make it as an artist who's not properly plumbing their pain for you know art points <laughs> I, mean, I don't know i think that i don't think that it's a prerequisite to be lynched in order to become Candyman. i just think that that is the common story but that's, but that's what they show you in every other instance especially through the puppetry story because like yeah i i agreed with you like i was kind of go to the same point of like we only see sherman and it seems like a little bit of a way to get out of the whole like tony todd idea but then like again he's wearing the same specific clothing he literally has a hook on his hand but then we're treated to this whole like puppetry show where it's like mm-hmm. no there's a lot of people like this and they're all kind of wearing the code and i kind of took that is kind of like a metaphorical coat except for in the Mm -hmm. ending the little man literally puts a coat on him i was like this is a little too much but if we saw some instances of that then like okay Mm -hmm. but it feels like they ride this line and don't really pick a lane and i think that's a detriment yeah Yeah, this seems like there's some yeah there's some kind of magical combination of supernatural and a very specific set of life circumstances you know, and we're not ever really given like what that magical for- crossover formula is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it's kind of a problem, but also I was just kind of like along for the ride. So it didn't necessarily bother me because the original Candyman, there's all kinds of stuff that you're like, I don't know. Wh- yeah. Why is why do these things exist? I don't know, but it's cool and I, I dig it. So I don't need to have all the answers, you know. But but I do agree that there's there's a disconnect between those two things. I totally agree with all. I, I think that yeah. I think, <laughs> the, I think the difference is in the first one they almost embrace that ambiguity and just like there's just mm-hmm. once you start to pick it apart, there's so many details that are just there. There's no dialogue about them. There's no they just exist in that realm. Whereas this movie feels like it tries to explain everything to you so then I naturally want to pick it apart it's like if you're going to give me the dialogue if you're going to give me the lore if you're going to give me these things well then I'm going to start to pick at it but I, I guess I guess that's the difference I see between this one and the original film this one almost wants to give you all the answers but then all the answers don't really line up I guess truth um, it's time to land the plane. I know. I feel like, segue, Bob. I, wanna, I feel like we got to say lot. one more thing to that. Just like I, one yeah, more quick yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The last thing I want to say about that is that in terms of dangling threads, there is at least one big one that, that bothered me a lot. And it's because it, it doesn't like, it's very much one of those things. that's just sort of a thing that exists in this movie. And that is, um, Anthony's fiance doing a whole flashback around her artist father. And mm-hmm. I'm still not sure what to make of that. Yeah. Other than yeah. the, uh, more concept of generational trauma, you mm-hmm. know, somebody I'm trying put that in my final critique as so, well. So yeah, I just want to point that out because I don't think that this movie Randy wraps Whitley. up everything with a bow by any means. So right. my glory, so my only yeah. point. <laughs> yeah, let's go ahead and rate this thing out of five. Um, Nicole, you're you're the esteemed guest. Uh, would you please do us the honors? What do you think, Candy Mang, twenty twenty one? Gonna make me go first. 
Uh, okay, so um, I really, really enjoyed this movie. Like, from the opening credits, which, by the way, the score is fantastic. And, I mean, they had really big shoes to fill. And that opening credit, like, little repetitive. I mean, it. I love it. Like, I'm going to be listening to that in the background while I work a lot. I um, mean, we didn't talk about that. Um, but I was, like, in from the very beginning. And um, there's not, like, much I would change about it. Um, you know, I don't think that it quite had, you know, the iconic moments that we have from the first one. It's not – it doesn't leave quite as much of an impression. But I still feel like it's handled well, like – the direction is good, which, by the way, shout out to Nia Costa because I'm all about supporting women in horror, and I think she did a great job. Um, there were some really cool shots in there, specifically the one where the art critic gets killed, but we see it from way afar, and she's getting, like, drug across the glass. Like, that was beautiful. Um, so my major critiques, again, were just, you know, the social commentary for me was was pretty clunky, and I would have preferred that we did a little more showing, not telling um, but as I said earlier, I think there are reasons why it's like that, that I can sort of forgive. Um, but yeah, for me, it, it pretty much hit on all other levels, character, production, lore, like I said, music. Um, so really just the clunky, some of the clunky dialogue and then the ending being messy are the two things that, um, that I would ding it for, but at the end of the day, I'm going to give it a 3.75. 3.75 out of 5 for Nicole. Uh, Randy, what do you think? Um, so I just went back and double-checked what I gave Candyman years ago, and I gave it a 3.5, which I feel is criminally low at this point <laughs> as we're sitting here talking about it. Um, so I, I, we may have to address that at some point. But as far as this film goes, I think that this is a far more suitable sequel to Candyman um, than either of the other two that we got already. Mm -hmm. I think as much as I miss Tony Todd's presence, like that was pretty much the shining spot of both of those movies for me. Otherwise, it doesn't really hold water for me. Um, I would say that this one, um, you know, it doesn't have. It, I would. It has all like a lot of the same themes. It has. It focuses on them with a modern lens, and the modern lens to me involves being forthright and open about what's happening. So I don't see the lack of of subtlety or whatever, or the lack of ambiguity on certain things, on, on like the themes themselves to be a, a detriment. I actually think that it's powerful to just call it by its name. Do you know what I mean? So I, as much as I see- No pun intended. Yeah, yeah, really. And <laughs> as much as I see that, that critique, I, it doesn't impact me that way. Um, I think that it's more powerful that they that they do address it forth like front front for facing. But I also see like that the to Justin's point the downsides to that, which are that you know what ambiguity you do have, which is kind of necessary to some extent um, in order to sell the rest of the like the actual lore. It, it kind of counteracts itself a little bit. Um, so it's they're playing with fire with some of the stuff uh, in terms narratively. But I understand the purpose of doing that, and I'm all for it. I think that this is the movie, you know, the other, the first movie was great um, at, you know, sort of sidling up against the point. This one just, just hits the hammer on the head and says, this is what this shit is about. And it also leaves enough interpretive room for you to spread your wings a little bit and try and see what else it has to say. I also, and just from a craft perspective, so now that we've got sort of the theming and the main point out of the way, I think... This is the movie is directed, acted, and just like the look of it is beautiful. I think everything about this movie is great. I think its biggest shortcoming is actually the writing, and it's just because you can take those things multiple ways. And I can totally see both Justin and Nicole's point on that. And it really comes down to to preference. And for me, this particular story needs to be told with you know less less fluff. You know fuck it you know this is like this is this has gone on uh at, gone on as sort of like no reason to pull your punches now do you know what i mean um so to me i think that's i think that it works on pretty much every level um with the exception of the writing being a little bit clunkier a little bit more um it's easy to interpret that in a way that works to the movie's detriment instead of to its benefit so on that point on that craft point i would ding it about a point 
Um, and I'm going to give this a four even, um, which is something that's going to have, I'm going to have to address that original score at some point if we get the chance. <laughs> you never know. We might revisit it. We might. Uh, I'm going to slide into these DMs real quick. All right, Bob. Out of five, what you think about Candy Mang 2021? Thanks for asking, guy. Mm -hmm. Allow me mm -hmm. to answer your question. Um, yeah, this movie is not particularly subtle. I honestly wish that it was less subtle than it is. Um, I feel like they're trying to make a very specific point, and the plot really muddles the point up. Um, ultimately, like after thinking about this movie for like a couple of days, I wish they would have done like a hard reboot instead of this sort of like sequel slash reboot. That's I guess now a, a trend with horror franchises. Uh, well, not even just horror franchises. I mean, Star Wars did it. Halloween did it. Candyman did it. Now Scream's doing it in January. We're getting Scream 5, but it's just called Scream. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jesus I don't. Ghostbusters. I don't like this as a trend. I think it worked well enough for Halloween because the Halloween franchise is just so incredibly muddled and going in so many different directions already that, like, okay, let's go ahead and ignore all that mess, and then we'll just start off where the first one ended. Whereas, like the Candyman franchise, you got three sequels; they're all in a row, whether you like them or not. Um, they they all have Tony Todd in them. Like it's it's a, a connected story. So like you could just do a hard reboot and then decide what you want to keep from the original, add whatever lore you want for the new one and make a very clear, very concise message and like, you know, cut out all this like guesswork that we don't need. Like I don't need references from the 90s. Ultimately, I'm interested in like the point you're trying to make today. Make that point as clear as possible because like now's the time to do so. Ultimately, including all this other like stuff all this like information and most of it is just like told to you it just bogs the movie down and it detracts from your ultimate message um i don't know the people that are killed in this movie i think are not totally deserving of it much like in the other candy man movies like you've got some like teenage kids that are killed and like a shitty art critic and like there's an art dealer i guess or something but like she he the dude works with anthony's girlfriend they work in the same place like i don't know they're just kind of shitty people but do they deserve to get murdered i don't really think so the cops in the end makes sense that makes perfect sense i wish there was more murders that made more sense to make the we all do movie we ring all out do. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm speaking uh, about murders. <laughs> always make sense of about fiction. Yes, about yes. fiction. We all we all endorse the idea of more smarter murders. Murders that make sense. <laughs> Anyone who has sex out of wedlock deserves to get murks. <laughs> Kill off. Um. Anyway, I I really really love the opening credits. Uh, the shots of Chicago. They're like all fogged out, upside down. Oh, I'm surprised that our mm -hmm. two graphic designers on the show didn't talk about the typeface that they created because that shit is nice. It's yeah. super good. It really, is. The original had a great typeface. This yeah. just kind of fucking it amped it up. Yeah, yeah, it did. I thought that was incredible. The score was phenomenal. Um, the, the movie is, is crafted very well. I think it's just written kind of poorly. And the third act was just way too rushed. I wish the point was a little more clear cut. Um, ultimately, I think I'm going to land at a three out of five on this one. Juice, how do you feel about Candyman? Who finally. All right. <laughs> so... Um, I'm gonna talk about a lot of the positives of this because I picked at a lot of things in our discussion. Again, the this is directed very beautifully. And when I was watching this, I really enjoyed the ride. Um, one thing, I covered the original film with Nicole last year and we talked about kind of the lack of kills in that one. I feel like they brought that one on this one. Um, the kills in this, whether they were justified or not, were not only cool in like a horror sense, they were just directed in a very fun, sometimes beautiful mm. way. Um, that first kind of big kill where they're in the art studio and you see him in the mirror and he rips the screen. There's like the drop of blood that drips down. Fantastic. And, and the way he was like attached like trying to get out and get caught by the ankle and 
he's getting pulled back and some you see things in the mirror but yeah I, it was just set up so well the i can't believe none of us talked about this but i have it in my the mirror scene where anthony is in the critic's house mm-hmm. or her apartment she's in the bathroom and he sees himself as sherman like that had huge impact in like the story they're telling the the overall metaphor and i see myself in this man but i'm also becoming him in this way it was also just beautifully shot but also horrifying and like because that man's face and he looks terrible but that was fantastic we somebody mentioned like the floating earlier that just looked beautiful um i don't there was a lot more satisfying like horror in this one coming off from that first one like horror kills like horror set up tension the body horror that we mentioned before i thought it they were all i thought they brought their a game on that one in the directing the way it looked the color palette especially like in that art studio kill the reds and the blues kind of had this like giallo little feel a little bit i just thought that kind of stuff was fantastic um And again, I thought it actually was really smooth tying in a lot of the the lore from the first one, or not necessarily the lore, but the overall story from the first one, tying it into this one in a very intriguing and maybe enriching way into this new story that they're trying to tell. Again, going over the bad things, the ending, I didn't, the way that that guy was used, um, William or whatever, I didn't like that. I think they could have handled it in a more natural way, kind of like Bob said, where this guy, he's already tied to all these murders and it ties into the idea of Candyman infecting somebody like they're setting up with, with Helen, like they told the story. It's like, is this guy, even the scene where the critic gets killed, it's right after he leaves you know the room it's right after he leaves the apartment so it's easy to set up that like he's actually doing this in a possessed kind of way but it's not what you're seeing or whatever it's so easy to just follow that natural trail that they set up that it felt so forced to me that william needed to be involved shoved the hook into his hand put the coat on him i was like this is too much that's that's way too forward that's like those are poor poor choices in my opinion the end the (laughs) whole ending the whole ending to me was really bad um the overall holes in the logic that we talked about the way that anthony is infected but they're also talking about the way you know all these other candy mans are created didn't really fit to me um another thing we talked about nothing happened with the girlfriend's dad also i just felt like her brother and her brother's boyfriend were just totally just forgotten about and were very <laughs> underutilized characters They're i love very, them yeah i love them too <laughs> yeah. and then they just disappeared for that shitty ending and i was like that that also felt like a poor choice to me um that's like all my major points i took in my notes overall i really like to ride but again once we started picking apart and thinking about it i think it is flawed in some serious narrative ways and also just the ending really hurt it for me overall i'm gonna give this a 3.5 out of five all right justin's 3.5 is gonna put our aggregate at a 3.6 let's go ahead and jump into our rotten tomatoes segment and see what the critics and users think about candy man all right so what we're gonna do here ladies and gentlemen if you're new to the cast this is our rotten tomato segment I'm going to have everyone at the table guess within the best of their ability what the aggregate scores are for Candyman 2021 on RottenTomatoes.com, both critics and users. Uh, we're going to start with the critics, as we usually do. There are, oh, uh, Rob, you've seen this critic score, yes? Yeah, I saw the critics, so I'll sit this one out. Okay, so sit this one out. Um, this has how many reviews? 236 reviews counted in the critics section. Um, Nicole, you're our guest. What do you think that the critics gave this film? Hmm. Well, I feel like the critics really like Jordan Peele. And, you know, he fits in that, like, prestige horror niche that I feel like <laughs> critics are a little more kind to. So, oh, uh, let's go with a s- 75. 75. All right. Soju, how about you? 
Yeah, I agree. I think this movie is going to get a lot of respect. Um, Mia Costa, she did a great job from a directing standpoint. Jordan Peele kind of attaching his name to this and helping out the screenplay and everything, I think has really helped it. And uh, you see that a lot in the marketing too. Like Jordan Peele, Jordan Peele, a lot of people think is directed by Jordan Peele. So coming off of like Get Out and Us, I mean, I think, I think critics... There is positive th- stuff to jump onto, but I think it's also riding that goodwill as well. So um, I I think it might be higher than 75, honestly. And I think it was kind of a big boom, like horror this in the theaters again. It almost felt like this was kind of beginning of like these good horrors, hopefully coming out, you know, like Halloween, Malignant coming out. So um, I, don't, I think they'll be positive to it and I'm going to go with 75. I don't want to go too high. I'll say 80. 80. Okay. Well, that was a decent instinct. The score is 85%. Ooh. Certified fresh. Certified whoa, whoa. Know. Can I get a hell yeet? Oregon. <laughs> um, Much better. <laughs> we're going to move over to the, critics, or the audience Damn. score. <laughs> Going over to the audience score, there are a thousand plus of verified ratings for this film. Um, we're going to start with Bob since he didn't get to chime in last time. Bob, what do you think that the users gave this film? I feel like it's going to be pretty damn positive, uh, maybe a little bit lower than the critics. Um, I'll go, critics was 85, right? It was 85, yeah. I'll take an 80. 80. All right. Uh, Soju, how about you? Um, yeah, I think people will dig on this. I naturally want to go lower than the critics, though. So I'll go with a 70. 70. All right. Nicole, where are you at with this one? Well, I've seen a lot of really, really hurt people on Facebook horror groups about this. So I don't really? Know. Oh my gosh, it's really bad. <laughs> it's oh really no. bad. Like not just like, oh, I didn't enjoy it. Like this is garbage. Like wow. This. wow. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube is not better. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So um, I'm like, oh, I love the horror community, but I'm thinking about disengaging entirely. That's wild. <laughs> um, That's really surprising to me. Yeah, but I've it also seen be. a lot of. <laughs> yeah, I've I've also seen a lot of positive stuff too. But I think I'm gonna go with. The, the straight chillin' spesh, give me a 69. Ooh. Whoa. Ooh. 69. Hell, Ski. Good. Well, hang on, Bob. Hold on your shorts over here. Ah, my shorts. Well, we're all going to hear about this. This was a 74%, which just edges out Bob to get Soju a second win. Well, that's it. That's- so yeah there you go (laughs) we're gonna hear about it um the critics consensus reads as follows Candyman takes an incisive visually thrilling approach to deepening the franchise's mythology and terrifying audiences along the way um that's fair that's fair audience says the 2021 Candyman may not be as scary as the original, but it expands the story in ways that fans of the franchise could enjoy. What who writes equal these? elements of horror, <laughs> just to kind of different. Dude, when I, he I pulled agree. his fingernail off, oh my Dude, god! Yeah, that shit is tough to watch. I that shit is tough I, I, to watch. We, I know we're done with the review, but I was surprised that his hand didn't just rot off completely. And yeah, it had to be. I thought that yes. was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. What yes. The hell? Yep. Uh, also, it's like, so I, there gross. was a whole like whole conversation to be had about the way he reacted to his name being said on television. I wanted to talk about that. We never got to it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Mm, I, uh, like I think that. there's that, that's, that scene is loaded. <laughs> yeah. um, I just don't know exactly with what. Uh, let's read a <laughs> negative review uh, as they are occasionally, on occasion, once every blue moon. Kind of funny. And at least we get to yell at somebody if it's not. Um, let's see. You should feel something. That the overwhelming oh that the overwhelming sensation provoked by Nia DaCosta's Candyman is numbness then is a problem. I don't know about numbness, dude. Nah, <laughs> not numbness. I don't Magic. Think so. I will say, like, I think that like some like as much as I love the acting, I think some of the characters were maybe underbaked. I think that's fair to say. Like, 
So maybe that's what they're talking about when they talk about numbness. But I feel like there's a eh. pile of footage on the cutting room floor here. Like they cut Definitely. out too much. I honestly think that if they had, yeah, I think they have, they had spent more time with the tertiary characters, maybe even a little more time with Anthony when he's not completely losing his shit. It might have gone a long way to that regard. But mm-hmm. although I will say it's kind of annoying me that every movie these days has to be two and a half hours. So when I saw <laughs> that this was ninety minutes, I was like. I'm I'm in I'm in for I the night. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I don't so. know. I think people taking the time they want to to tell the story is a good. I'm 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 rarely bothered by a long run time personally. Yeah. Well, I mean, if uh, if I don't feel like ten to twenty minutes needs to be cut out of the movie, I'm fine with it. But <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that's fair. Looking at you, Netflix originals. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> Just think you can load us up with hours of bullshit. <laughs> All right. We're done. Uh, I'm, I'm done. So. <laughs> thank you, Randy. Uh, it is now totally time for trivia. It is totally time for trivia. Juice, what you got for us? All right. Actually, some interesting trivia. Not a whole, whole lot. But um, the film series was based on the short story by Clive Barker. Does anybody know the short story that this was based off of by Clive Barker? Looking at you, Nicole. Whoa, that's a hell you for Nicole. Um, She is correct. Based on The Forbidden by Clive Barker. In response to the success of Freddy vs. Jason, a crossover film with Candyman um, entered development. Does anyone want to take a guess of who Candyman was versus? The leprechaun. So it wasn't one of those other two? It was somebody else fresh? One of those other two what? Freddy or Jason? Jason? Freddy or oh, Jason? no, it was it not. Was it was else. somebody fresh. Well, it's got to be... Oh, my God. I'm, I'm guessing it was Chucky. That would just be the okay. diminishing... Candyman versus Chucky. Candyman. I'm going leprechaun on this. Nicole, would you like to take I already... Guess? I know this piece of oh. trivia, so right. I will refrain. Well, Bob is also going to get a hell yeet. Oh, uh, yeah. What a horrible... Horrible choice. Yeah, Candyman versus the Leprechaun. I'd watch that. Now, this is what Tony Tony Todd Ireland reje- versus the Hood. <laughs> Tony Todd rejected the idea after being present <laughs> in the script, saying, "I will never be involved with something like that." I believe that. <laughs> Tony, hold your ground. Tony said, "That's no, fucking sir." That's that is fucking where good. I draw the line. Yeah, like it's one thing. Like if if it was like I don't know. I, I don't know. Like maybe like. Fucking Leatherface or something, but somebody serious, not yeah, somebody whose like leprechaun. whole thing is like cracking jokes and pogoing yeah. on people. <laughs> um, in two, 2004- why not Ginger Dead Man? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> in two thousand four, Tony Todd confirmed to Fangoria that a fourth film was moving forward with Clive Barker's involvement in a twenty-five million dollar budget. By two thousand nine, um, Dion Taylor was attached to direct the film. Who is that? I don't know. Okay. Dion Taylor was attached to direct the film, which would have been set in New England during the winter at an all-woman's college and would ignore the events of Candy Mang Day of the Dead. The Mm. film eventually fell apart due to disputes among the rights owners. Mm. So, what could have been? Except I heard that third one's pretty bad, so... Yeah. Yeah, you heard correct. (laughs) So uh, that's all the interesting trivia I have. Uh, I have a little piece of trivia that was not pointed out. So um, whenever Anthony is first in Cabrini and he's taking pictures of some of the graffiti on the walls, there's a little almost like Sasquatch looking man. And Mm -hmm. that is Clive Barker's original sketch for Candyman. That's what it looked like. Oh, shit. Nice. Yeah. He was like all hairy and kind of monstrous. <laughs> Sounded like that. That's, yeah, so I thought that was a cool little nod. Nice. Like nothing cool. I'd ever smelled before in my life. Huge <laughs> doo doos. <laughs> <laughs> that was the real candy mag. <laughs> Negative. <laughs> uh, thank you, Juice. I'm going to put you back to work because it is wow. time for Cooter of the Week. Chillin'. 
Juice, what's Cooter and why are we hunting them? Thanks for asking, Bob. Cooter is a character type and a straight, chillin' excluse. Cooter must hit three of these five points to be considered a Cooter. We want the Cooter with most points. Uh, the five points are, Nicole, do you want to hunt? Do you want to, can you name the five points? Let's put I always, our guess to the test. Yeah, I always think I can and then I always forget one. Okay, so. So does um, Justin. Yeah. Welcome to, <laughs> welcome to every week. all of us. So, Smug Eric. He's really just trying to creep up your knowledge right now. <laughs> yeah. Smug oh, arrogance. okay. So you weren't prepared and you want me to pick up the slack. Okay. <laughs> smug much. arrogance, uh, sexual deviance, overall look and attire, manipulation, and overall patheticness. Whoa! Nailed it! Nailed it. Nice. <laughs> Nicole is certified cooter hunter. Yeah, Nicole is hashtag hard with us. That is correct. Does anyone want to uh, nominate someone to cooter court this week? The only hmm. There's only one that's coming to mind for me right now. I don't know about okay. you guys. Um, and I don't know his name, but he is the co-worker of Anthony's fiance at the gallery the guy clive. Who gets the gallery guy. clive is his name clive it is i did not pick <laughs> up on that um all right well clive and I, it's primarily because it, they make it pretty explicit that he was he hires like intern or gallery uh gallery uh, yeah, assistant yeah, or whatever assistant. based entirely off their willingness to like Sleep like him, him. Yeah. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. And uh, they're so about sexual to, you know. deviance, huh? So that's, but that's like, that's maybe smug arrogance. Yeah, I think smug arrogance. Mm -hmm. He's pretty shitty mm -hmm. about like, like he, he and pretty much anybody in the art world in this movie are very much like snooty as fuck and mm -hmm. playing into that, that pretension that Nicole was talking about. So I guess you could say smug arrogance as well. It just bounce off that idea of artist in this film. There's one scene where they go to dinner that we didn't talk about. Um, yeah. where there's this guy who just reminded me of Danny DeVito's character in, in fucking Sunny when he goes go go Gablogian or whatever when yeah. when he tries to sell Charlie's art anyways that's a total oh, he's side he's like Truman Capote looking guy. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah so he's got the I would say smug arrogance and sexual deviancy because of I mean, um like I might push into manipulation as well. Yeah. And were you going to say that, Nicole? You go ahead. Yeah. Well, if I may, I feel uh, like we no. might have a, a, a straight chillin' cooter hunting first because okay. I was going to nominate the couple together because, oh. because together I feel like they make one really horrible cooter because <laughs> so as we said, um, he definitely has the smug arrogance. I think definitely, I think he has manipulation because he's basically manipulating Brianna to get Anthony to do what he wants. Um, he also mentions something about necrophilia, how he always wanted to like oh, check yeah. that off his bucket list. And so sexual deviance. Is that a joke or not? I couldn't tell. Um, I don't know, I but like, even as a joke, I was, it yeah. hit me as really icky. And then yeah, she. Yeah, that's not somebody you say before you bang someone. No, <laughs> no. Unless they're dead. And then she just struck me as super pathetic. And I would also give her overall look and attire. And here's why. Because I actually. You know, like Joy Division? Like, well, no. I, so I actually really dig her look. I think she's. I, I'm like, I would wear that outfit. But I think the look and attire is cooterish because she's very much just. Okay, I have to have the colored hair and the boots and yeah, the Joy Division t-shirt because I have to fit into this world. Mm. So I feel like when you sort of like combine that all together, that this couple together like hits. And I build on almost that. Every I'm going to build on that because, sorry, Rob, go ahead. I would say, yeah, she does also like keep speaking in like song titles. Yeah. Joy Division titles. Yeah. Very pathetic. That's pretty smug to me. <laughs> um, I don't know these titles. Damn um, artist. God damn joy division loving tea drinking sons of bitches. Um, no, I, so I want to, I want to build on that. The manipulation this. thing, this is not actually applicable to those two characters, but I kind of want to lump the entire art community in this film <laughs> together. And it's because like, I, I was just thinking about this and I had forgotten about this when I mentioned it earlier, but the part about um, Anthony's fiance, whose name I cannot fucking remember. Maria. Brianna. Remember. Brianna. Um, Brianna. Thank you. Um, she, uh, 
has this conversation after the murders, after the murders start happening, she has a conversation with an owner of a gallery in town. And the lady is like, she's like, oh, making inroads. I'm making inroads, whatever. And it's great. But then the lady starts sort of like pushing her to like dig into her past, which involves her, her father, an artist committing suicide and her husband or fiance rather about to, like implicated in these violent crimes as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And she's, again, it's that thing of like asking people to plumb their trauma for, for art points. And for, yeah. if it, that gives it the authenticity that makes people think that it's actually valuable art, even though, you know, I know that those opinions may vary. So I think kind of like the art world ad, as a whole is kind of a cooter. Cause to me, that is an extreme form of manipulation within that realm. Yeah, it's played um, very shittily. And then even the art critic, you know, her, mm-hmm. like, I don't know, what would that be? Smug arrogance, my guess. Oh, the so way she smug. just shits mm-hmm. all over this guy's work. And oh, then mm-hmm. as soon as people get murdered, she's all about him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And she's like, she's like, oh, well, you know, you artists are what gentrify things, which I'm so glad that they were explicitly saying no at, yeah. at that assertion later on. It's like, fuck you. Yeah. This is like this is not what this is about um anyway so i think i yeah and and even the gallery even clive himself like he when we first see him he's at he's looking at um uh anthony's work and he's like this is like you five years ago man i need something interesting you know and like i think clive starts bringing up or i'm sorry anthony brings up i think does that point he bring up candy man at that point yeah he does uh yeah well he said he's gonna do a series on the projects and yeah. when he said he said where where i grew up and the and clive is yeah. like oh no that's been done and yeah, so he's, he's like, like oh well it's also the thing. basically yeah so that's when he brought up cabrini which is what which is why he went out there so yeah so i would like to propose uh that all artists go to jail please <laughs> i'm down throw the book in the fist. art community that's like <laughs> randy and nicole yeah I'm, I'm ready to go down with this shit Let's get them. Cooter creators. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I don't have anyone else really to, I was thinking about like William, but I don't think he hits enough really no. overall. I think he's just a psychotic so. person. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, our community. I think we got them. We rounded them all up. We got them. <laughs> we got them. Man, we'll fuck get art. Fuck <laughs> art. Art's bullshit, man. It art can be anything. Bullshit, man. It kind you know of is. <laughs> the only art that matters. <laughs> the only art that matters to me is one and thing and one thing only. Pumpkins. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Pumpkin art is the only art that matters. Jack o' lanterns. <laughs> the only um, true medium. <laughs> it's guess. it's time to get into the social hour. We're talking about what we've been watching this week. Hey gang, what, what you been, been watching? watching? Yeah. Randu, what you been slamming into your eyeballs? You know, it's been pretty light for me this this past week. So, um, one thing I'll bring up, which I don't usually do, is a an album I've been listening to by a an artist called Laura Stevenson. It's a self titled album. I've been a long, long, long fan of hers, and uh, this new album is fucking great. It's sort of like um, acoustic singer songwritery type stuff. Not not even really entirely acoustic, but um, I don't know, really like gut wrenching shit. I highly recommend it. It's tough to describe as music tends to be. Um, is it yeah, it's as kind good of as Joy Division? Uh, it's better than Joy Division. Um, <laughs> it's better it. than your favorite band. And it's Project 86? Than, uh, yes, it's better. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, wow. all, 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 all irony aside, yes. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? I, I also watched uh, a movie called Emily, E-M-E-L-I-E, on Shudder. The French one? one that, Is that the French girl? It was not. No, not oh, okay. that's Amelie. <laughs> oh, okay, my bad. <laughs> this trying is to be cultured film. over here. No, no, I, <laughs> no. Um, this is a movie about a. Basically, the the short version is a girl pretends to be the new babysitter at this family's home, okay. for unknown reasons, and then starts doing things uh, with the kids. You have basically have a Ooh. nine-year-old kid protagonist and his two siblings. Okay. Um, which is weird because it's like the second movie I've I've brought up and what you've been watching in, in in a month maybe that has been like a a kid about that age as your main protagonist versus um 
an, a, more or less an abductor, I guess, in a sense. Yeah. So it was pretty good, though, I would say. I think it's uh, it's not, like, earth-shattering. It's pretty much just kind of is what it is. There's not a whole lot of, like, not a whole lot to dig your teeth into theme-wise or anything like that. It ain't it ain't elevated horror, if you will. Wow. But it's pretty Pinkies good. It's pretty out. fun. Yeah. <laughs> you can keep your pinkies right on in there. Tuck them in. Um, and then last but not least, uh, I watched a sh- very short true crime documentary called Mur- Monster in the Shadows, which I believe was on Hulu. I could be mistaken about that, but maybe it was Peacock that was on. But anyway. Um, Too many streaming services. Yeah, and so many fucking true crime documentaries. But this one's a pretty short one. It was three 45-minute episodes, so manageable. Um, and it was heavily stilted towards one person in particular um i would say that like craft wise it was not the best true crime documentary but it's a truly fucked up story nonetheless yeah. and it's like it's one of those how things... many of those stories exist for them endless. to make documentaries Fucking <laughs> endless. It's a lot. And, yeah and this one is is no different it's it's just an extremely heart-wrenching story of some some folks in uh, i, I want to say alabama was it alabama somewhere deep south and they were very very r- rural folk uh, and the the person who was murdered was called Brittany Wood, and it kind of it just branches out in ways. It, I will say this: like, if you take the story of Laura Palmer and add some true life horror to the nth degree, you've got this girl's story. And a way of thinking, yeah, it's it's no good. Gotta it's no good. slam some Garmin Bogia or whatever. Totally. Oh, <laughs> lots got lots of cream corn around this particular Oof. story. That's Extra it for me. Cream. All righty. Nicole, what you been watching? Um, well, I haven't actually been watching much the past couple of weeks because work has just been insane. But um, over the past like couple months, I've watched some interesting TV shows. Um, the first one is Marianne on Netflix. And it is a French um, story about a witch. And I have been hearing just, like, really, really great things about this show for, I don't know, a couple of years. It took me a couple of years to finally sit down and watch it. And um, I really enjoyed it. Like, it's very spooky and has some truly horrific moments. But it's also kind of fun. Um, It has a little bit of, like, an It vibe where this author, um, she writes about this witch named Marianne. And um, Marianne is a witch that like possesses people and like an incident like back at her in her hometown happens. And so she has to go back to her hometown to kind of like unravel the real Marianne. And so when she gets there, all her childhood friends are there and they kind of like band together and like help her figure this out. So it's it has that sort of like unsettling, super creepy French thing going on. But then it's also kind of like playful and heartwarming at the same time. So um Definitely recommend. It's again, it's French, so subtitles. Um, but it's 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 worth a watch. There's only one season, and it got canceled. So you know, be aware of that. But I think it's still worth watching. Um, another one is we ended up getting Peacock, and so Limetown is a show that I have wanted to watch for a long time, and it's on Peacock. Um, have you guys listened to the Limetown podcast before? Never have. Uh. Uh-uh. Okay, so it's, a uh, I think, six episode. It's fiction. Um, but it is a woman following the story of Limetown, which was this, like, sort of uh, utopian, like, town where all these scientists came and they were, like, try- they were working on this one specific discovery. And through the course of the podcast, you find out, like, what this discovery is. Because it's very secretive and things go wrong and... Um, the entire city of Limetown, which is like 350 people, just disappear and nobody knows why. And so this reporter is investigating it. Um, Facebook Watch produced it. So it wasn't really available anywhere for a long time. And then it showed up on Peacock and I was like, okay, I got to see this. So loved the podcast. Um, the show was, I thought, done really well. So if you like that sort of fictionalized true crime mystery i would listen to the podcast and i would watch the show if anybody's gonna know where to find those people it's probably gonna be facebook (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so uh and then the last one i want to mention and we talked about this on the slack channel a little bit is mr mercedes and it is also on peacock 
It is based on a Stephen King book that I have not read because it's one of his uh, more like detective crime novels. It's not really horror at all. Um, but it's about a detective who is retired and there's this one crime he never solved and like he's an alcoholic and he's kind of lonely and so this case haunts him and the guy who committed the crime starts contacting him uh, via email with these cryptic videos and like taunting him and um, it just it's like it has some really dark moments like the whole show is just really dark even though it's not a horror show and if you're a horror fan there are just a couple of moments in particular that stand out that like disturbed me more than anything I've seen in like a long time um so I've watched the first season there are two more and part of me I just like need a break because I'm like I can't binge three seasons of of this show um but yeah, again, if you like true crime, detective type stuff, I would definitely check out Mr. Mercedes. Awesome. Solid roundup. Hey, Juice. Hey, buddy. Hey. I'll let you go. Whoa, thanks, Bob. What you been thanks. watching? Um, actually, it's been pretty light for me. I'm going to start off by saying I'm drinking a Southern Tier Warlock, which is an Imperial Pumpkin Stout. <laughs> uh -huh. I bought a four pack of these, which is the only size that they sell them in for $14. And it tastes like crap. <laughs> I like it. It's gross. It is gross. More for me. I don't even know how this flavor is considered pumpkin. It tastes like dirt and or soap. <laughs> <laughs> i had one like a week ago and i was like ah maybe i was just like not in the right mood for it so i brought another one over tonight it's so gross i don't get it <laughs> um what i've been watching though i've been keeping it um light and fun but with the spooky vibe so um i been watching what's new scooby-doo which is scooby-doo that came out around 2005 i think it's got this kind of like punky vibe they always have like this i don't know it's hard to describe it's got like brighter colors and stuff but they i feel like they i haven't watched a ton of episodes but i feel like they're taking some old ones and kind of making them more modern um so which is which is fun to kind of see because some of those older ones are like heavily dated um and just their overall storytelling methods but um, that's fun. I've also been watching Mystery Inc., which Hell is the one that yes. came out in 2012. Good shit. Which, like, doesn't do that idea of taking the old ones and kind of bringing the new. It just, it almost pokes fun at the old kind of vibes. But it's got, it's, I don't know. They're both really fun, spooky vibes, but on a super light note. And I've just been in, like, like I said, I've been on a huge scooby-doo kicked i th i think i pretty much watched or yeah watched through the original uh uh scooby-doo where are you which is two seasons and then i watched a little bit of the 13 ghosts of scooby-doo or whatever that's garbage that yeah, that's bad garbage the um, only good thing about that is the vincent, <laughs> vincent yeah Van i Google agree yeah which is so unfortunate uh, uh, yeah but it's it's near unwatchable um a little Not bit a big of the, fan? yeah a, oh my god uh and daphne's the one that they kept around what were they doing um i watched a little bit of scrappy do uh, which is not great but it's like it's better than the 13 ghosts that's for damn sure so you anyways i've been on this though. huge scooby-doo kick so i think i'm just gonna kind of ride it until i'm tired of it um because there's are lots you, of content are you gonna do the the, the live action films May I kind of want to, you know? I, you know, I, I actually should... don't know if I've seen that second one. I have seen that first one, but it's been a long Dude. time. We we should talk about this more after the cast. <laughs> okay, <laughs> damn. Um, so I've been on that kick, and the only other thing I've been watching is I finally got to get into the new Marvel show on Disney Plus, What If? And there's only three episodes out so far, but I just... They're short, so I was able to knock them all out back to back. I like the overall idea. I like the art style that they go with. Of the three that came out, though, only one of them was like actually kind of good to me. I feel like because they're so short, the pacing for me is not great. Um, it's too fast. 
um, because they uh, it feels like they have to squeeze a lot into just kind of uh, they're like a little over 30 minutes i really like the one where black panther was star lord though that was like my favorite one i thought that was a great kind of like heartwarming story and um the other two were just okay um so we'll see we'll see where it goes from here but um it's it's fun enough and you know you can breeze through them pretty quick uh but that's all i've been watching bobby uh, ro- huh? bobby uh, yo are you drumming right now yeah sorry uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do with my hands. Artist, <laughs> am I right? Bob, what you been watching? Uh, I have been working through the Scream franchise, so I rewatched Scream 3 and Scream 4. Ooh, um, that's the, the good the one, Scream 3. Whoa. I, I feel like every time I watch Scream 3, it's basically the first time I've ever seen it. I always forget <laughs> the ending because it's bad. Um, yeah. This time round, I think I enjoyed it more than any other time round because I just was, I had zero expectations. So when I saw the ending again, I was like, oh yeah, that's still kind of dumb, but whatever. I, I also completely forgot that there's like Jay and Silent Bob. They make a cameo in this movie. God, I don't remember anything about that movie, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with Bob's assessment that like you just forget you just it as soon write as it you watch it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's ultimately still the weakest installment in the franchise. It's also got like a Carrie Fisher cameo in it, um, a Lance Henriksen cameo. It's just like got all these random people in it, which is fine, but I don't know. It doesn't really add anything to it. Also, this shit is like banging Creed. It's got like two Creed songs in it. There's oh. a Creed poster on the wall. Like Damn. Creed's all over this fucking movie. It's just sign of the times, I guess. Um, <laughs> Scream. Scream and Creed. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. indeed. They both have a hard E sound. I, uh, that's that's the common link. That's the one. Regarding Scream 4, though, I feel like every time I watch that installment, I enjoy it even more. Um, it seems almost like as time goes on, it becomes more and more relatable, which is sort of like terrible because the obviously what happens in the movie is it's a bunch of people get murdered. Um, but it seems like more feasible so in a way. Um, I feel it, yeah. Which I, I don't know. I, I, I again, uh, I think Wes Craven was probably just a little bit ahead of his time. I remember when that first came out, I was like, this is wild and stupid. Nobody thinks like this. This technology barely exists at all and now it's like yeah i could 100 percent just kind of see this stuff happening which is horrible um i really enjoy that movie though for what it is um other than the the uh, scream franchise um i threw on the guest because we're you know we're getting into september <laughs> couldn't wait and yeah i couldn't wait this is i mean this is obviously currently on the poll um there's no way it's gonna win though so i was like ah, i feel comfortable just throwing this on it's one that i watch uh, every spooky season i freaking love this movie um if you haven't seen it i think you really really uh, should check it out uh it's early adam wingard flick uh solid halloween vibes um it's very much an action movie though uh, i read a review long ago and somebody called it like terminator meets halloween that's very much kind of the vibe of it pumpkins galore <laughs> the soundtrack is just like banger after banger um how many creed songs are on that zero soundtrack? creed songs oh, okay. hallelujah Canceled. done we're, we're uh, done with this one <laughs> always enjoy that movie i also saw um a brand new movie to me anyways it's called sundown uh, vampire in retreat um uh, i guess this was from like the late 80s early 90s maybe i have to google to confirm the exact year but what really interested me in this movie is it's uh bruce campbell uh, is in it and he plays van helsing he's hunting vampires oh, shit yeah that sounds awesome yeah i'd never heard of this before vestron just put it out so i picked it up and watched it it's very like uh fun tongue-in-cheek it's it's not scary at all uh, it's just like God, group I of watch this. <laughs> you i think you dig it man it, it's a big group of vampires living out in the desert um and they have like this this like little hot you know how i feel about sand i that's true i do know exactly how you feel about sand <laughs> not a fan uh, but these vampires have developed like uh, a sunscreen that protects them from the sun and uh <laughs> they wear it all the time they've got like these like vampire scientists what if you miss a spot uh dude, you're mm. fucked <laughs> You can't use the spray. What if, what if it doesn't? What if it doesn't 
uh, soak into your skin and you just keep rubbing and rubbing <laughs> and it's just just like a white layer of paint on you you remember, that's probably better just, are you describing my life right now i'm describing i'm describing a situation you found yourself in just a few weeks ago which my still skin, makes me laugh my skin doesn't Rob's like to skin absorb just rejected sunscreen. The sunscreen. does not accept sunscreen into it that was <laughs> just your white. body totally whiter than i already am yeah uv he protection looked like he got there. painted with white paint <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I enjoyed that. I recommend checking out uh, Vampire. Uh, sorry, Sundown Vampire in Retreat is the name of that movie. If you vote for Casper, I'll post that picture of Rob and his white paint on the Instagram. No, I'm just kidding. No, you won't. That's never <laughs> seen one. <laughs> uh, that's all I've been watching hey, this Bob, week. Yo. Did you say you watched White Lotus? The White yes. Lotus? He, did. he mentioned that last White week. Lotus is super awesome. Have you seen it? Yeah, I forgot. I forgot to put it on my list. I was going to mention it because I thought you had mentioned it before. It's pretty good. I finished it, and it's you know I'm I'm a little like unsure what to take from it, but yeah, it's yeah. an it's an interesting story. And yeah, I don't some know really what good good acting going on there. Hard hard agree. I don't know what to take from it necessarily either, other than I just enjoyed watching these people do crazy shit. Like Steve Zahn. I don't know if that was his truly his dick and balls, but I mean, dude. That is a prosthetic dick and balls. Or, like, it looks super fake. I tried not to look too closely for the seams myself. Dude, but. it's like, <laughs> it is a hard close-up on some dick and balls. He's like, he might have like testicular cancer. So he's just like pulling on his nuts. It's it's insane. Oh. Please make that a future bump. No. <laughs> it's going to be a gif on the slack. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh yeah like white lotus is, is pretty <laughs> it's on hbo it's only six episodes if you're uh, interested in some drama i'm interested in that check it out steve zahn's nuts um <laughs> we got <laughs> we got one more segment to get into and that is of course our hotline screams hotline screams If you're listening and would like to call in and leave a voicemail to be featured on our show, hit us up at 904-638-3231. we got three voicemails this week. First up, we're going to hear from our boy, Tom. Let's hear what Tom has to say. Hey, boys, it's Tom. How you doing? I've got a little something on the mind. This is Candy Main Week. Um, what is your favorite movie theater candy, eh? Personally, go for Bunch Crunch, toss that in with some popcorn, you're good to go. But I would like to hear what you guys think. All right. It's been a bit since I've talked. Um, take care of yourself. I think we're officially in spooky season with theatrical horror, but, you know, I thought spooky season started August and Friday the 13th, but, you know, that's just me. Okay. Take care of yourself, Shell Mang. All right. Who wants to jump in? Talk about some snacks. I don't do candy often. I'm definitely a pea corn man. Mm. Always ride with the pea corn, cherry Coke, or mm. cherry uh, icy. But if I'm going to go with the candy, it depends. If I'm in a chocolate mood, I feel like I always go for the raisinets. If I'm not feeling in a chocolate mood, I always go for like the gummy worms, like sour gummy worms. Those are kind of like are my we two. Um, are we sticking to things that you can literally buy at the movie theater or can no. we stick stuff in? No. <laughs> no. <Back in reality. laughs> no. <laughs> you got a full okay. emperor on that one. Mm-hmm. Nicole, what are you snacking on? Um, well, I love chocolate. It's always chocolate. So if I'm purchasing at the theater, I will get the bougie like chocolate covered almonds. Mm. Um, love those. Um, but more often than not, what we like to do is we'll swing by like the dollar store and get, you know, a big giant thing of candy that's cheap. So usually oh, yeah. that's uh, M&M's for me if I'm going to do that. And, uh, I, I like a theater that's got the, one of those, um, freestyle Coke machines and I will get a cherry vanilla Coke zero Ooh, to go with hell that. Yeah. That's you, got specs. you got yeah. the full specs. <laughs> you got the chemistry that's, set. I yeah. Like that's it. the plan. <laughs> Andy, what you snacking on? Man, you know, I'm sitting here thinking about it. I also don't go sweet very often when I'm at a theater. I tend to go salty. Not always pea corn, as we are dubbing it. 
Um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I, I usually like to do nachos or something because I'm, I hate myself. But um, if I'm gonna go candy, then what I'm gonna do? I want to roll it on. <laughs> God <laughs> no. damn. But I might go with a like a big snuck in bag of Sour Patch Kids. It's probably the way go. it'd go. Sour, nice. Randy, sour snack. It tastes better because he snuck them in. Mm-hmm. It's, the, the illegality mm-hmm. makes it more appealing. <laughs> it makes it that, that much sweeter. <laughs> We're going to get erected. Let's get erected. Always getting erected. I'm definitely a pea corn boy myself. That's that's my go to <laughs> snack for the movie theater. Um, that's a new bump for you, Randy. Can go ahead and catch that one. I do want to add to that though. I know a lot of people like like Tom mentioned. Drop some bunch of crunch on there. I know a lot of people do M and M's, chocolate stuffs on top of their pea corn, which is a solid move. I'm down for that. But during spooky season, I usually sneak in a little bag of candy corn, drop that on top of oh the pea corn, God. and the God. salty sweet is God. just yeah. fucking what delicious. It was sweet. married yeah. to the beast. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> Try it. Pea corn and sea corn. Pea together? corn and sea corn. PC That's corn. Too much corn. I only eat corn. PC corn. <laughs> Put some corn nuts in that bitch. <laughs> oh, Easy Bob, I, got I got a, my feet. I can scrape into there if you like. Ew. Yeah, I got a recommendation for you. So, okay. do you ever stay at a Hampton Inn? Have you ever stayed at a Hampton Inn? I have. Yeah, all <laughs> okay. the time. Every oh, week. So, <laughs> so you know they do. They they have the complimentary breakfast, and more mm. often than not, they have the waffle maker. Mm. And if you stay at a Hampton Inn at the right location during spook, spooky season, one of the things on the bar. Is candy corn nice and you can put that candy corn on your waffle put a little Holy whipped shit. cream so nice just, you, yeah you need to seek out a hampton inn <laughs> during spooky season i'm just going for happen. breakfast that's i'm where, not even gonna stay there that's where rob <laughs> eats all his mistresses <laughs> Go I'll, take, <laughs> I'll take one <laughs> continental <laughs> breakfast please <laughs> I love yeah. being incontinent. Incontinent. <laughs> I used to put a, a candy corn on my ice cream when I would go to the uh, Golden Corral as a child. Uh, <laughs> hard recommend for that. European style. European style. I don't think so. Uh, Golden Corral is European style. That's exclusively <laughs> uh, Anyway, that was a hell of a change. The Golden Corral. If you're at the Golden Corral, I mean... <laughs> By definition, you are a cow. Like you are part of the corral. <laughs> well, I've been there. Ready. I've been that cow. What about what about Ryan's? You're just a Ryan. You just belong to Ryan. If you're at Ryan. <laughs> If you, look, if you got yeast rolls, Quince. you're automatically 30% better than whoever you're talking Quincy's? about. Quincy's? You guys remember Quincy's? Quincy's. Uh, we're we're we got... just going through all of the like very regional <laughs> buffet chains. Country yeah. Kitchen Buffet? No, <laughs> nobody? <laughs> we got two more voicemails. Tom, you've ruined our show. Look at what you've done. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from our boy, Jack. Let's hear what he has to say. What up, boys? It's Jack. I rambled on for a bit too long last week and got cut off, so sorry for rambling. So I'll keep it real short this week. Um, top of my head, what was the pumpkin beer you guys shouted out in the last episode? It, you seemed really good, and um, where would I order that? Is it like, a, does it have mass distribution, or is it a local brewery or something? Uh, my local brewery is huge, and it carries um, pumpkin and all these other random October-themed beers. But I want to try it. It seemed good. Uh, the question I wanted to finalize uh, and end on last week was if Friday the 13th came back, which the only reason it hasn't is because of all the lawsuits and whatnot, what would you want to see th- the movie be? Would you want it to just be another Friday the 13th, Jason Killing Campers? Would you want to see anything new or original? or would How would you want another Friday the 13th? Or do you think there shouldn't be? It should just be what it was and what it, what it always will be. Uh, if you've never seen this little short fan film called Never Hike in the Snow, that's what I'd want it to be. It's a fan film, has Friday the 13th themes, and I think Jason's in it, if I remember correctly. It just takes place in the winter, and for some reason that completely gives new life to it, the fact that Jason's just in the snow. I don't know. I thought it was cool. And finally, I got into a fascinating conversation about horror movies with uh, some random person, and we were talking about how it seems every horror movie takes place either in the past or is about ghosts. And I said that this is because of technology, that nowadays you can just call the cops at any time. 
So um, what is your favorite movie, if you can think of one, that has gotten around the whole you can call the cops thing? Is there any movie that sticks out in your mind that had a really clever way of subverting this? The only ones I can really think of is It, because Stephen King wrote it where the, you know, the town is cursed, so people just kind of let things go and no one actually alerts anybody. And uh, weirdly enough, The Purge. I'm not too fond of The Purge, but the entire concept of that movie just seems to get around the whole, you can't call the cops, bud. So when things come a-knocking, uh, good luck, because uh, you got to either, either you have it or you don't. But anyway, I'll leave it with that. Enjoy the rest of the week, guys. Later. All right, I'll start off since he was asking about the beer. I have one here. I showed it on the behind the scenes, my guy. But I, um, I'll mention it again. It's from Heavy Seas Beer, which I'm not familiar with them. It's not a local thing. I picked this up at the ABC, um, the liquor store. It's the first time I've ever seen it. Nobody else had seen it before either. But it's called The Greater Pumpkin. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a pumpkin ale brew with pumpkin pumpkin and spices aged in bourbon barrels. I have been drinking mm. it so tonight. Apparently, that brewery is located in Maryland, and we're able to buy it in Florida. So they obviously distribute pretty fucking far. Yeah, um, I know they have it at Total Wine. I've seen it there. Okay, so um, it was good. Find it I had another one tonight. A hell, a lot better than fucking Southern Tier. I'll tell you that right now. Um, <laughs> what a hater. But I actually, I was going to say the same. I haven't seen that fan um, short or movie, whatever you mentioned, Jack. But I thought the idea of a Friday the 13th set around Christmas would be yeah. cool. Um, we talked about just the aesthetic. The the yeah. Before, yeah. Even yeah. further. Yeah. It's like Jason saves Santa. I would, I would want to watch that. Well, <laughs> I, don't <know laughs> I don't think he's saving anybody. But I mean, just I the idea of a movie called Jason saves the Santa. aesthetic of christmas lights and snow and even like jolly like christmas tree like the whole everything that goes to christmas i think that's completely opposite of what you typically see in a friday the 13th and i would be very intrigued to see where that could go that movie is called silent night deadly night wow <laughs> what what was the other thing he asked uh he, he asked uh, about sorry go ahead bob well, yeah, I, it's regarding Friday the Thirteenth, real quick. If they're going to make another one, which I think they totally should make another one, um, yeah, go back to basics. I don't need anything new. I don't need you to reinvent Jason. I don't need you to make him a pot farmer or send him into space. Just let him murder some kids and some counselors at a camp. Like that's what has worked in the past. Just like go back to basics. It's you don't need to reinvent the wheel here. It's it's unnecessary. Anyway, the other thing he was talking about was like uh, writing around just being able to call cops mm. in horror movies. If we can think of any sort of um, interesting examples where that has been successful, what would those movies? Midsummer popped into my mind because of the location. Yeah, that's true. In my mind, like I don't, I can't think of a lot of like examples, but like I don't, I know I don't have a big problem with the excuse of, you know, oh we somebody took them from us or you know just mm -hmm. something basic yeah. like that yeah perfectly fine yeah. Or, or like if you're like got a care couple of characters on their own oh we fell in the water and now they're broken like that that works perfectly fine to me yeah i was thinking about uh the strangers yeah because they're kind of in the mm. middle of nowhere and you know they're already distracted because they're having their own crisis and then of course the the assailants like just take out all their methods of communication and it's it works fine <laughs> You know, there there is one that I can think of off the top. Or actually, now that I'm thinking about it, is fucking Fear Street franchise. At least in the '94 edition, there's you know ample reason to call the police in a normal situation, but the police are not. They they only interact with the shady Sunnyvale. Uh, no, the other one, Shady Grove. Shady Shady Side. Oh, Shady Side. Shady, shady Side. They only interact with the shady side citizens in a negative way so they don't want to call them which is kind of playing into the whole you know thesis statement of the franchise i think so i i think that was pretty clever because it, it factors into the narrative in a way like yeah you don't want to call the police because they don't trust them period mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the strangers was my thought exactly nicole that's it's a solid example of it but like yeah if you're set you live in like way out in the boonies like if you call the cops it's gonna take them how long to get there so like what is it what is even the point um yeah, solid questions, Jack. Thanks for calling in. Hope all is well. 
Uh, last but not least, we're going to hear from Cole. Let's hear what Cole has to say. Hey, guys. Cole calling. I'm um, just calling in to, about the uh, uh, Friday the 13th episode, the advice you guys gave me. Uh, I wasn't expecting such a solid answer, so uh, I really appreciate that. And I think I'm definitely going to going to strap in for the long haul and uh, do what you guys suggested. Um, and uh, I guess the other thing, <laughs> especially when you guys started doing Malort shots, I thought I was just going to get a ridiculous fucking answer. <laughs> but uh, uh, speaking of Malort, so to, to be fair, I've never, I've never drank Malort. I don't, I don't think they sell it in at least Manitoba, Canada. I don't know if they sell another place in Canada. But anyways, um, so I don't really know how heinous and like dreadful it really is. But um, for everything, I mean, I've had some pretty gross shit, and this has worked for that. If you have um, pickle juice as a chaser, and if you have the equivalent amount of pickle juice of what you just drank, the second the, like second you swallow the pickle juice, the aftertaste is gone. Nice. So I think you guys need to grab a jar of pickles, grab another bottle of Malort, and test this theory for us, and then uh, and then let us know what you find out. So thanks. But we'll test this theory in November. That sounds that sounds like yeah. <laughs> that you, it sounds like you're at serious risk of compounding your pain. Is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense though. I actually like love dill pickles, so Same. I would be probably okay with that. And it makes complete sense because it's such a strong potent. It makes a kind of flavor. sense, but but Malort having drank it several times now i don't know if it's possible to like i don't chase think holy water would juice. chase it i don't think there's anything <laughs> that chases that shit it is heinous i could like when he like mentioned the name of lord the cleanser. taste kind of popped up into my mouth that's how strong it is it's still in there <laughs> It's it doesn't gross. go he's, away. He summoned Malort. He did. He tastes yeah. like him. You say Malort five times in the movie. <laughs> yeah. And then you're dead. Oh, Malort. Generational oh, trauma. Malort. Oh, Malort. Um, oh, Malort. Um, Malort. I don't know if I guess how you say it. Oh, Malort. <laughs> Just the ho is editorializing. Pickle um, juice. <laughs> and what was it? He, uh, I, he mentioned that we gave him good advice, but I can't remember what advice we gave him. It was my good advice. It was he was talking about his wife and child did not like horror films, and I was talking about spooky seasons coming up. You got to start off with the kids' horse, some Casper, some Hocus poker, poker, those kind of things, and then you know, kind of slowly build up, throwing some Alien in there, you know, building some sci-fi, and then you know, just it's a it's a twelve month program. It's quite a leap from Poker Poker to Alien. Well, I'm just saying, and like, Mark, I'm talking about a slow build here. I'm talking. You know, I know like, what you're doing. <laughs> corrupting America's youth. <laughs> yeah, I'm down to drink some pickle juice. I fucking love pickles. Me too. That is that would be a treat. Not butter pickles. <laughs> Fuck them. Just all of them. I Just like me some some gherkins personally, but we know you do, Randy. <laughs> I like me the gherkins. Randy's a gherkin kind of guy. I like a gherkin with a merkin. <laughs> oh yeah. Sweet. <laughs> Thanks for Colin Cole. Uh, we'll report back in November after we finish off that bottle of Malort. Hopefully we'll have a jar of pickles on I'm ordering deck. a fresh bottle just to yeah. be safe. For Randu's wedding. We got to polish oh, her Jesus off. Christ. I'll bring a case. A case of pickles, hopefully, not Malort. <laughs> if you bring a case of Malort, you will not be invited back. I assure you. <laughs> Too late. We're bunking up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, thanks for calling Cole. Again, if you're listening and want to hit us up and leave a voicemail to be featured next week, uh, you can do so at 904-638-3231. Again, Nicole, thank you so much for sitting in with us this week. It's always a pleasure having you on. Um, and again, feel free to plug uh, Light and Shadow, remind people where they can find your show. Yes. So it's uh, Light and Shadow, a horror podcast. You can find me on pretty much all the podcatchers. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Right now, I do not have like a specific like consistent show schedule. I was doing monthly episodes, 
And I just decided to sort of take a break because I was getting a little burned out. And I was like, I don't want this to turn into something I feel like I have to do. I want to release episodes when I feel like I really have something new to add to the conversation. Um, So saying that, I'm sure I'll be doing something for Halloween. Um, I might just be doing like reading like a spooky creepypasta or something. Those are always kind of fun. Um, So keep your eyes peeled for October. And then also, um, I'm making a trip to Central Florida in October, and um, probably I'm going to Spooky Empire. It just kind of depends upon, of course, like the climate and the COVID numbers and all that. But if I do make it to that, uh, I have a friend who I'm meeting there, and so she and I will probably do a little bonus episode about our time at Spooky Empire. So, so keep your eyes peeled for that. All right. Awesome. Um, well, next week we're gonna be back with a brand new show, and as luck would have it, we're actually gonna be getting into your Patreon pick, Nicole. Ooh! Um, you do you care to tell us what we're gonna be talking about next sure. week? Sure. You guys are gonna be watching the new French extremity gem, Calvair. Ooh! Why'd you pick that one, Nicole? Uh, you know, I I've only seen it one time, and it was a really long time ago. Uh, in my like early twenties. I kind of went down a rabbit hole of weirdness and new French All extremity is a yeah a big part of that. And Cal- Calvair was one get- of those Calvair was one of those like weird little kind of like off the beaten path. Like people sort of talked about it, but most people I know haven't seen it. So um, I actually had a, a few that I wanted you guys to watch, and I I let uh, Bob pick. I was like, "Do you want this thing, this thing, or this thing?" And he I picked. I see. Uh, Bob yeah, didn't he, consult me. I on actually this. did. I just don't text don't. both of you, and you both responded, <laughs> and you just don't remember. Ha! So I don't anyway, <laughs> so it's you know it's, it's new French extremity. It. So just buckle in. That's all I'm gonna say. Buckle oh. in. Interesting. <laughs> European style. Sounds like. Iron fist and mob to me. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it Got is. spikes on that gauntlet. Check out Cal there from 2004. We're going to be talking about that next week. Until then, please rate, view, and subscribe to us on uh, iTunes. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at str 8 underscore chilling on Instagram at Straight Chilling Podcast. You can send us an email through our website, straightchillingpodcast.com. And until next week, as always, all you mother truckers, please keep chilling.